welcome everyone. Uh, ho hope you are going to be sticking with us for the next three hours. We're going to be doing a small session on basically getting started with MISP and encoding threat reports and seeing what different tools you have at your disposal and how to basically formalize and contextualize a very simplistic concept basically uh, in MISP. So what we're going to be doing now is uh, we, we have a, a, a VM available for you to use. So it's, it's a hosted instance. Um, uh, Sami is already uh, showing on the screen uh, the details for the instance, it's username and password. Just pick a username from one to 15 there. So it's training one, training two, and so on, and use that to uh, log on to the instance. No worries if you're more than one person sharing the same uh, username. Uh, it will work just fine. Just please do not share into your password because you might lock the other users trying to use the same account at the same time. Uh, all of the uh, details are also available um, uh, in the link that are posted by both Alex and Sami now. So just have a uh, look at that uh, and copy paste over the credentials and so on. So the way we wanted to to uh, to run this uh, this session is we're going to be kind of splitting the group in two, so to say in that we're going to give a, a short introduction of the exercise itself. So everyone is welcome to, uh, uh, to just listen in on that. And then afterwards, if you're already a user of MISP, get started with that with the exercise and do it yourself if you can. And on, at the same time, for those of you that, are, uh, that have not used MISP uh, as much before or are completely new to it, we're going to be walking through the example together uh, on the stream. So we're going to be encoding the data, we're going to be explaining some of the decisions we make and so on. And at the end of the entire thing, we're going to spend some time going over the different uh, data packages that were created by the various participants, looking at some potential hints on how they could be improved, uh, as well as some discussions on some of those choices of naming conventions, what sort of contextualization views and so on. So a little bit about the exercise itself. Uh, so if you scroll a bit down there, uh, the exercise uh, revolves around a simple situation where basically um, we get an email from um, the CSERT of a telco operator in Luxembourg in this case, where they inform us that they had an incident um, where basically uh, the uh, CEO received a spear phishing attempt. So an email that basically mimicked uh, the school of the CEO's daughter. Uh, and tried to impersonate uh, her teacher and basically pretended to send a report card along uh, uh, as a malicious attachment to the email. So all of this is described with various data points in the email, uh, as you can see there. And the idea is that we're going to take this email and we're going to uh, encode this in MISP directly. Uh, now, before we, we, we start with all of that, for those of you that are, are completely new to it, we're going to first talk a little bit about the different tools that are at your disposal, how you would normally uh, create data, how data is structured in MISP and so on. If you're already familiar with that, just get started with the exercise and encode it. And then we have more material to talk about afterwards when we talk about best practices. Uh, so just a small side note, in addition to the email, there are two additional uh, files that are uh, were part of the original email. So you can just download those from those two links directly. Don't worry, they're not malicious files. It's uh, it's literally just putty.exe and something uh, else. So don't worry too much about it, but we're going to pretend that it's something malicious for the exercise's sake. Okay, any questions before we get started? Yeah, that's a good point that you mentioned questions. So during the session, really feel free to uh, ask any question either in the chat or in the, the Q&A section. We'll be mon monitoring these to uh, uh, these two for uh, well, reply for anything that would pop up during the session. <clears throat> okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so yeah. I think we can just get started. So uh, for those of you that are familiar with MISP, now is a good time to get started with the exercise, start encoding uh, uh, the uh, email as an event. And for, for the rest, we're going to now talk a little bit about how MISP works in the first place and, and walk you through some of the basics. So if you've logged onto the instance, this is what you're going to be seeing. So MISP basically deals with sharing all sorts of information about threats. So those threats can be of various different categories for us as a CSERT. Uh, obviously, cybersecurity related ones are going to be the main concern that we're dealing with. However, any of these data packages that are shared are 
clustered into what we call an event. So these are generic containers for data. What you're seeing here is our event index. Each of those entries there is an event. Now each event has an owner, so someone created the data. Each event carries some context, for example, a description of what this event is meant to do, it carries a bunch of labels, as you can see there, which help us to categorize and to group events into different uh, categories. And they also come with, uh, with some rules attached on where the uh, data is allowed to be shared. So this is what we call distribution uh, in MISP. So anytime we create data, we can decide who gets to see the data in the end. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the different options here when we start creating data, but this is the high level explanation of what the data is that we're dealing with here. So as you can see here, just to explain this on one example, if you look at the second event there in the list, it is coming from a creator organization called Kudeso. Uh, we have a local ID for the event, which signifies where we can retrieve this information on our given MISP instance. We have some labels attached that basically tell us, okay, this is TLP white information. This is uh, something that has a certain certainty uh, attached to it. Uh, and also basically uh, uh, describes the type of event we're dealing with. So in this case, a block or a filter list. In addition to that, we further to the right, we see that uh, this uh, event has a description that is meant for an analyst that sees the data to understand what we're dealing with here. So this is an internal blue exploit actively used to deliver remote access Trojan. So that's a pretty fair idea for us to know what we're dealing with. And then we see that the distribution in this case is limited to the first .org members. So that's just, we're going to talk about how this works uh, in a bit, but this should give us already a good overview of what this event does. If you wanted to see what's inside this event, we can click on the ID or the view icon on the right, and that will bring us to the individual view of the event. So this is the main view that contains all the data of, of, of the event as well. So here we see on top of the uh, uh, data points that we've seen on the index already, we see a bunch of additional stuff. For example, on the right, we see relations to other existing events. We see relations to feeds, so some overlap of the data contained event overlaps with some of the data contained in certain feeds, and so on and so forth. And if we scroll down, then we get to the meat of the entire event, which is the actual data contained within. So in this case, it's a flat list of attributes. So those are our individual data points, where each of those attributes in this case is an IP address. So it's, it's a pretty straightforward event in, the, in that sense. We see that each of these data points on the bottom has some additional context around it. So we see that they carry a category and a type, the category describing in what context this data point uh, is relevant in. So that's network activity that we're dealing with. And this expressed as an IP destination. So that gives the value some context as well. Now, the type is important because uh, uh, just as future reference, it decides the format in which you need to express the data. And it also uh, uh, ties into the various different rule set generators that we have in MISP that, for example, generates Ricotta rules out of this. So, so the type in combination with the category and the value is used to make those decisions, how these get transposed into the different other output formats. Now here, we, uh, this is a pretty simplistic uh, event. We, can, we could also composite individual attributes into describing more complex structures, uh, like a uh, file uh, object, for example, would have different uh, data points attached to different hashes, file names, entropy, uh, and so on and so forth. And we're going to see how that works in action. But basically, this is like the very, very simple explanation of what a data looks like. We're dealing with events containing data points, and then those data points get further contextualized. So if there are no questions about this and, uh, and, and, and if this was clear enough that we can get, uh, just get started with um, uh, we just creating a, a, an event as an example event to see how that works. Um, and I see by the way that uh, uh, the person behind the QDS organization is also in the, <laughs> in the group here. So that's nice to see. <laughs> So let's get started with creating um, uh, an event so that we see how all of this actually works in practice. So every time when we're starting out with encoding any information in MISP, the first step is that we're going to start creating a new event. So, that, so just go to event actions and select add event as your first entry point. This is when we're creating this envelope for the data that we're about to create in the first place. Now, this is a very simplistic uh, form that we need to fill out. You can see here, there's very little data that goes into creating this event. 
But here already we have to make some crucial decisions. For example, how we're going to call the event, how, who do we share the event with? This already gets decided at this point. Now the event info is our description, our main human to human communication, basically, so to say, in describing what this data package deals with. Uh, some caveats here that you might want to avoid, uh, avoid basically, uh, make sure that it, uh, that when you're describing an event, that it's universally understood by the community that you're sharing the data with. Now, this is already kind of a loaded statement because who you are sharing with will change over time. So that very often when you're starting out with NISP, you deploy it as an internal tool, you fetch data from all sorts of different sources and you encode your own data so that you basically have your own detection rules and so on. Uh, uh, being the output of your analysis work, for example. And one of the tricky things here already is that if you're doing something for your own internal use case, then that might conflict in the future with the readability of the data for a wider audience if you ever decide to share it after the fact. So some recommendations here, uh, be concise and, uh, and use generally understood terms. So don't use things like your internal ticketing number ID, for example, if you're a ticketing system, because that won't make any sense to anyone else. Also advised is, is use English when describing the event info. Um, I mean, we're all prone to using our own languages when we're uh, talking to our colleagues, to our peers. Uh, but the moment you're stepping over those boundaries, that becomes tricky if you have to do translations of all, the, uh, all descriptions. So that's already a good starting point. On the other hand, if, you're, if you know that it's going to be data that will be kept internal national level or within your own organization, then obviously you don't have to follow these rules. So let's just encode uh, something for the event info. Uh, quickly so we can get started. So, yeah, this whatever demo event, whatever. For the distribution level, we basically dis de uh, define how far the data is allowed to flow. And then this basically has two systems that work side by side. So just a quick explanation on both. We can either define how far the event is allowed to flow in a four stage system. Your organization only means my own organization and nobody else on my server, or I can select community only which would mean any organization that has access to this MISP instance. Or we could go a step further, use connected community, which means any other community that we interface with uh, from our MISP instance. So if our MISP instance has connections to five other MISP instances, then all members of those five instances would have access to the data as well. And finally, we have a setting that, that, that looks a little bit scary at first called all communities, which means anyone that is in our network of MISPs. Now, how, what it actually means really depends on your network. There are MISP networks out there that consist of a single MISP instance. So when you're installing a MISP instance and you're not connecting anywhere else, then your MISP will be its own community. So the only one that you can share within that case in your network is yourself. If you include one other party in the exchange, then, it, then all communities will mean two servers. If you get a big branching network of different MISs interconnecting with each other. Obviously, this setting will mean a much wider distribution, but it does not mean by default distribution to anyone out there using MISP. It is still confined to your MISP network. And then we're going to talk about a little bit later on about the fifth setting, which is called sharing groups. So these are distribution lists where you can create named lists of organizations that are involved in the exchange. For example, you can create a sharing group for the financial sector of the Benelux states, which would include a wide range of different organizations collected and maintained in a, re a recurringly used list. So you have quite a bit of flexibility there if that's the way you want to go. But going back to our example, let's just take something simple now. We can just choose your organization only for now. So let's create our event. Now we have our, yeah, sorry. Maybe, maybe a, an additional uh, command regarding the, the creation of event because you might think it's a bit complex to, okay, think in advance, okay, which sharing group I should choose and so on. But sometimes, and very often what happens is a lot of people start with like just your organization only and then later on you can change it. Um, so that's quite important too. It's, um, if you have some doubt about how far you want to share this information at the beginning, maybe just Sherry pick something that is like very restrictive at the beginning. And then when you are more comfortable with information that you want to share, you can share like the, the, 
but don't share in advance all communities if you don't know in advance if you want to make it more restrictive at some point in time. Yeah, indeed, once it is shared, there is no re real way of revoking it. I mean, we can issue a revocation, whether the receiving system uh, uh, actions on that or not is up to the implementation and the system that is on the remote side. So just be careful with that. If, you, if you're worried about leaking out too much information, always go indeed with Alex said, more restrictive option first and then relax it over time. You can also do, uh, so uh, we we're going to see that more in depth later on. We can also make these decisions on each individual data point within the event as well. So you could create an event that is has a lax distribution level where certain data points would get restricted. Some typical use cases for that, if you have an investigation ongoing, an incident, and you were uh, uh, inserting all the data that you're extracting from during the incident response, into a misp event, you might end up with some information about the victim, for example. Now, this is something that you might want to share with the victim, victim themselves, or perhaps just keep fully internal. But either way, uh, that is something that is not meant for a wide public consumption. So in that case, you would limit those data points further than the rest of the event. So going back to our event, though, we now have a, a basic event created. This event so far has no data points. So if you scroll down a little bit, Miss, you will see that Miss warns us, do not publish this event yet. There is no data in here. So you have to first add data to it. We also see that on top, the publish flag is set to no, which tells us that this event currently exists in an unpublished state. Now, what this actually means in practice, even if we had chosen a, lot, a wider distribution level, Miss would not propagate this data out to other MISP nodes uh, as long as it is not published. It is also not actionable the data. So if we add, if even if we added malicious IP addresses, for example, to this event, it would not be used uh, as an actionable data point. It would not flow to your protective tools that are connected to MISP, not until the point that you actually publish it. Very often, this publication process is kind of split from the normal analysis work, where you have analysts encoding information and some people vetting the information and doing the release control of the information in the end by publishing when it, when it is vetted, when all the ch check marks are set basically, and then you're good to go. So this part, none of that is done yet. Uh, we also see that something weird happened while we're creating an event. So Miss added some data points to our event already that we were not aware of at, until now. It added, uh, for example, the most basic thing, the creator organization. So who encoded this event is, is now baked into the event. So that is our organization, depending on the user that you're authenticated with when you create the event. We also see that a bunch of tags have been created. Now, these might not make that much sense and, and uh, at, at first, but these come from the instance itself. So that means that on this instance in particular, we set certain tags to be the default for any data created on this node in particular. This is interesting if you have a small network of MISPs internally, for example, in your network, where you have one MISP that is purely there to collect information from spam or from uh, honeypots or from different collection uh, sensors. Uh, and then basically uh, you already know a little bit about the data created there based on the source that you're, uh, you're, you're feeding information from. So in those cases, those endpoint MISPs that, that deal with certain collection uh, work would already contextualize the data a little bit for us. So this is just an example of that for the demo instance. But uh, normally at the end of the process when you're encoding data, we will go through the process of how to contextualize the data in the end. So let's actually start adding some data points to this event. If we scroll further down, we see that we our attribute list is empty for now. So let's start adding some attributes. If you click that little plus button above the attribute list, then you can start encoding your attributes. So just as a reminder, attributes are individual data points. They can be, for example, malicious IP address. They can be something uh, completely different like a file hash, or they could be a, a link to an external resource where you, where you can uh, read a PDF that uh, details more about the, uh, the ongoing attack that you're describing or it could be from a completely different domain even. It could be the first name of a, a person, for example. This is more, less for the CSERT use case, more for other use cases, such as border control and so on, uh, where you would see that used more often. So when we're encoding an attribute, basically what we need to know about it is we need to already know the context and the type in which we're expressing it. 
This will already drive MISP's decision-making on uh, how to validate the information and how to categorize the information. Now, this can be a little bit uh, cumbersome at first if you don't know, so we'll see some alternative ways of, of where to get started from. But if you have this information and you want to have as much accuracy as possible, this is your go-to tool for encoding the data. So let's, uh, for example, encode a malicious IP address in this case. So what we're going to do is we're going to select this category network activity, and we're going to just select three uh, or insert three IP destinations. So let's just select IP destination, and then we are going to enter three IPs uh, in the value box, separated by a line break. By default, MISP expects a single value to be created in attribute creation, but we can override this behavior and we can tell MISP that we actually want to import several values and check the batch import uh, checkbox. This will turn each line that we enter into a separate value. We can also tell MISP that these are malicious things that we're entering here. So we can just check the intrusion uh, for intrusion detection system checkbox. This is a little bit misnamed. Think of it as something malicious to automate on. So it's just a, a Boolean flag that basically differentiates an observed data point from an actual indicator. You can also set uh, additionally information about when this data point was first seen and last seen in your network, for example, uh, but this is completely optional. If you do not set this, then the creation time of the attribute will be set as its timestamp, and that will be the only, day, uh, only point used for uh, timelining data. Let's also add another attribute, by the way, with uh, pod8, just to see what happens. Oh, yeah, there. And something else that we didn't really talk about yet, if you scroll back up, you can also set the distribution at this point. So, so by default, MIS will just use the inherit event setting, which means that whatever the events distribution, the attribute will align itself. But if we, we wanted, we could add additional restrictions or additional rules on who we are sharing with already at this level. But let's stick to the inherit event for now. Let's create our attributes. There we go. Our four attributes have now been created. And we already see some stuff that happened here in addition. So we see that last attribute there, the quad eight. So it is obviously a Google DNS address. The MISP already warns that there's something is wrong with this one. It recognizes it as a potential false positive. So in this case, uh, it, it is a known IPv4 DNS resolver. So it is probably not the actual indicator that you're trying to share here. MISP only warns us about this simply because, um, uh, because we have set the IDS flag on this attribute. So we mark this attribute as something malicious. That means that if we have a seam, if we have IDSs and so on hooked up to our MISP, this would end up in those tools and it would start generating alerts for us. And obviously it's a false positive in this case. So MIS tries to warn us about it. So let's go and edit that and let's remove the IDS flag from that. Okay, there we go. And now our warning is gone. Uh, now MIS doesn't complain about it anymore. We no longer consider this as an indicator. It's not going to be in our detection rules. It still might be valuable information if, you, if we were to add a comment to it saying the malware does a network connectivity check every 30 seconds to this IP address, that's still valuable information but it's not an indicator in itself. So we, this, uh, we've seen something else that happened here. We already saw that a bunch of additional relations were added to the attributes. So it means that these attributes exist in some other events and judging by the relations not being there at the start, but them being there now, it's good that two people are playing along. <laughs> so <laughs> we, have, we now have correlations with your events as well. Uh, so what happens to, uh, uh, with the correlations is whenever we create an attribute in MISP, MISP will try to see if that attribute is already known in the system. Now it will keep in mind access control in terms of if you, you have to be able to see both events for the correlation to be visible to you, but it, it already gives us some ideas and pointers on what else to check. So it means that if someone has encoded information about malicious uh, activities, and you're encoding your own data and you're seeing links to them, that's a point for you to look into that other data set as well. See if you're not dealing with something similar or the same thing so that you can find some potential links and know where to continue with your analysis process. Perhaps you're saying, okay, this was an entry point for a certain type of attack. Let's see what the follow-up was and let's see if we're seeing those same things in our network to validate it. Sometimes it's just reuse of infrastructure and so on. So and it's not a given that it's going to mean that it's the same thing, but it's a starting point for your analysis, basically. 
As for the correlations themselves, we also do correlate on some other things. So for example, not just direct matches of values. For example, if you're encoding fuzzy hashes via SSD, then we have a threshold of how big the difference can be between two uh, hashes before it's considered a correlation. Same thing with CIDR blocks, for example, if you're encoding network ranges and uh, IP addresses, then those can cross correlate as well if the IPs are in the network range via CIDR blocks. Okay, so that's just a, a small note here. Now we've created four attributes and it took us a long time and it was tedious. If you want to be faster in encoding the data and offloading this entire encoding process, we have another tool at hand called the free text import tool. You can either access this via the button that, uh, the bo uh, button that Sam is hovering over or alternatively by clicking on uh, populate from on the left side and then selecting the free text import button. Okay, let's go there. Now this allows us to just paste any text into a field and MISP will then do the parsing of the data. The idea is that we have a bunch of different uh, parsing rules and uh, that would, for example, detect IP addresses, different file hashes, uh, domain names, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the idea is that, that, uh, that instead of encoding these manually, if you're dealing with a large report, you just paste the entire report in there and rip out those the different data points uh, by this tool. So Sammy is just showing a small example. Perfect. So sometimes what we do is if there is, for example, a new sync report by a vendor, just take the entire thing, paste it in here, and it will rip out all the individual data points. Or there is another tool more suited for that that we'll see later on. Okay. It, another interesting thing, what, what Sam is showing there is including an IP address that is uh, defanged. MISP also handles the refanging of attributes in this case. So let's look at what the result of this would look like. So here we see our different data points got parsed out. Uh, whatever was defanged is now refanged. And we're, we're basically at the point where we can already start creating attributes out of them. Now, there are still some decisions left for us to, to be made. One of the things that MIST tries to do is it tries to use the category and the type of the attribute that we're dealing with based on the parsed out value. So we see here, for example, um, uh, uh, that um, uh, google.com was recognized as a domain and it, it defaults to the category. But in this case, we don't really know if a domain was really meant. Google.com could also be a command file in uh, DOS command. Uh, executable. So we, we don't really know that. So Miss just picks the most likely option and then you can still refine it. And you could say actually google.com was a, an execute or, or a binary file under Windows or a shell script file. So um, we can refine it if we really want to. In some cases like the URL, MISP is certain that this is definitely a URL. So it will just lock that value in with no option left for us to choose. So when you're at this screen, make sure that you go through the triaging of everything that was picked up. Remove what, what was picked up erroneously. For example, very typical when you're just pasting over a vendor report. You don't want to have Kaspersky.com, for example, picked up as, a, as an indicator because it's obviously the, van, uh, the vendor's uh, domain. Or if there are some URLs that link to other uh, articles and so on, you don't want to include those as indicators but you still might want to include them as data points. It's a different story. We also see that, uh, that we have some correlations in here, especially when you're encoding OSINT data. One of the things you'll notice sometimes is you, you take a report, you loop it through the free text import and every single value that was found correlates with the exact same event. That probably means that someone has already encoded that OSINT report. So at this point, it's probably best to just drop it and just try to enrich what's already out there. But if, if you see that this is still something distinct and something that you want to encode, make those modifications and just click on submit attributes to create our attributes. Now, once we have created our attributes, uh, we can, uh, you see it worked exactly the same way as the individual one um, with some advantages and disadvantages. So let's talk a little bit about the advantages. We were much faster this time around because we didn't have to encode each individual attribute type separately in, through a separate dialogue. For example, domains, file names, and so on. I would have to do all of those one by one with the normal attribute add to. We also 
uh, uh, left MISP with doing uh, the thinking for us, so to say, and selecting the valid types for each of those values. We didn't have to think, okay, what categories are there? What type might this be that I'm describing here? Because this was all presented to us as a list of an option of three different values, for example, for a type. The downside is obviously that, that this will not find everything. So there is no black magic AI in the background. Uh, what we have there is really just a set of regexes that tries to, to pull out the most common indicator types that we're seeing in there, or value types, CPEs, and so on. Uh, if you're seeing something that should have been picked up by the tool but wasn't, let us know about that. So we're tuning these rules whenever something doesn't get picked up. If you're finding a new defanging uh, method that we are not aware of, let us know about that as well. We will include that in the, in the parser as well. And we're there to fine tune these. But generally, the way it works is you either encode all the data manually yourself, or you're using the add attribute button, or you go through this free text parsing first and then fill in the blanks what, with whatever wasn't picked up from the report and use this as a first uh, pass, basically. The latter is usually much faster uh, than the former. So just some ideas on, on how to use that. Finally, what we ended up here is just a flat list of, uh, list of attributes. So we're still just dealing with individual indicators, which is not that handy in itself. We don't see the links between these data points. We still lack context, so we still have a long way to go until this is actually really useful for us. So we have two, uh, uh, two other ways of basically taking these different attributes and, com and, and building more complex structures out of them. One of them is basically to take something that already exists. So we encoded our attributes very quickly with a free text import tool. We can massage the data now and start turning it into something more useful. So what Sami is doing now is he selected two of those attributes, google.com and, and quad A. So these things uh, belong together in this case and want to express that. So we can combine these into an object, in which case MISP will show us, okay, these two attribute types that you've selected, they can be used to form a bunch of different objects in this case. So domain IPs is a good candidate, for example, for something that we might want to be describing with this. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You could find in google.com, that's a bit unfortunate for this. No, no, it's not IP, it's domain. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so just domain. There you go. Okay, and now let's combine those two. Right, and now we see domain IP is one of the top choices. Let's pick that one. Now, Mr. Asks, uh, asks us that it will now come bind these two attributes into a single object using domain IP uh, object. Uh, it's, it's coming from this templating system for building these more complex structures. Uh, if we accept the, this change, then the two attributes will emerge into an object. So let's do that. So what happened now is we see that those things now suddenly belong together and, and they've been given context within the object as well. We see that in the domain IP tuple, the IP destination that we had there is it now becomes the IP component of this object, and the domain becomes a domain component of the object. So it's a rather straightforward translation. But among a, a list of just free floating attributes, we now see that these two data points belong together. Another approach to getting to the same point is to manually already start crafting objects from the get go. So if you don't want to first ingest all the attributes and then go through 10,000 attributes to decide what belongs together, you can also directly start including objects from the get-go. And for that, we use the add object button on the left. We get a list of different categories to choose from. If you're unsure, that's fine too. Just click all objects and then start typing the concept that you want to express. For example, if you want to express, uh, maybe let's say something as a file, for example, then, then it would present some options for us that contain the, uh, the value file. So in this case, there is an actual file object. So let's just pick that. Now, the, as you can see here, the template itself consists of a bunch of different potential elements. It doesn't mean that you need to fill everything out. Obviously, when you're encoding information about uh, network activity, files, whatever, you will probably not have a complete picture of everything, especially if it's not your own analysis, but you're encoding OSINT uh, data. Uh, there is a question uh, uh, about uh, the advantage of objects versus leaving them as, an, uh, as attributes, what the advantage is. Uh, so indeed, so that, that's something that comes up for, uh, uh, very often. The problem with individual attributes is that, that I, as an analyst, if I look at a list of attributes, 
I don't know in what context they're really interested in, interesting in. So if I see a bunch of different file hashes, that bunch of different file names and IP addresses, I don't know what the relationships between these are. For the file example, it's even more annoying. I don't even know which file hash belongs to which file name if I have 50 file names and 50 file hashes in there. So I want to basically combine everything that belongs together. So that's one part of the story. And next we'll get to soon is this also allows us to start building graphs out of our data. So generally, we really like our story not to just generate detection rules, but to tell us a story as well, so that we know what we're dealing with as analysts instead of just tools that are consuming a list of indicators. So we'll, we'll see some of the outcomes of that in a moment. So we're just halfway there so far. Maybe in addition to, to the advantage of, of going further and already using an object from the early beginning, um, if when, when you get an OSIN report or a report from, from a trade intelligence company and so on, sometimes you, you basically have a table of data with all the hashes and so on, but you don't know in advance what will be the uh, additional hashes of this file. For example, if you do an expansion on various total, things like that. Um, so sometimes it's interesting to start really uh, from, the, from some of the early beginning with a simple object with a single hash, for example, and just a file name, and then you uh, gradually expand the data with the additional hashes and so on. So the, the object from the early beginning is interesting too, uh, because afterwards, if you have just single attributes, then you need to merge them put into the object and so on, so you can uh, really create this context. And um, Sami show, show a functionality there in, in, in MIT where you have this uh, ability in the object to add an attribute on the fly. Um, so like you don't go to to need to go through this uh, complete table where you have to look at all the name, field names and so on. If you know the field to add, you just add, add on this uh, plus button on the left side there uh, and directly add the value. So uh, I would say in, in any case, if, if you have, we, we always show the, the introduction with the attribute because it's really the, the, the initial data point that uh, Andras was mentioning. But if you have the option to either select an object or an attribute, always go for the object because the object is, is really an opportunity to add more context, add more information, more data points. Um, so I would say it's always an advantage. And there are additional uh, advantages like relationships that we will uh, show uh, later. Yeah, there is one more thing in addition, uh, which uh, Sami, when you were showing that you already hovered a bit over that is that uh, you also get an additional layer of context on top of the, uh, the category and the type. So we've seen that already that uh, every attribute basically has to have a, ca a category and the type that gives us some idea about what we're dealing with here. But very often, we, this still stays something very vague. So some examples are that we have the date time attribute type. Now, date time in itself doesn't tell us what that date time actually references. But if we're expressing it as part of an object context, we see here that that uh, date time is now describing the first scene or the last scene or the registration date of this domain IP tuple. So that already gives us an additional uh, layer of context on top of the individual attributes as well. Uh, so uh, even if, if you were creating a, a single object template with a single attribute, you would end up with more information than if you were just creating a flat attribute. Okay. So let's now add our uh, our example uh, with the file that we've created before. Did you already add it, Sammy? No, no, no. Okay, so let's just quickly do that. Let's add a, a file object. Ah, okay, there's another interesting question. Uh, how do objects attributes compare to indicators and observables in the sticks world? Okay, so first of all, indicators and observables for us are on the same level and they're simply differentiated by uh, the Boolean flag, the IDS flag. Very simply because we want to have this, this moving of indicators becoming observed data, observed data becoming indicators over time, cleaned up uh, 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 compromised infrastructure that was used as a C2, for example, would become observed data over time instead of just an indicator because it's no longer an indicator at some point. Now, as for the actual structures of how they map, attributes and objects map to a bunch of different things in sticks. So that means that generally, if you have an IP, attribute that would map to either an indicator or observe data in sticks, depending on whether you have the IDS flag set. But on the other end, we can express a lot of other things via objects and attributes that don't have uh, that simple mapping. For example, a CV ID, uh, ID for us is also an attribute, but CV would map to a vulnerability object, if I remember correctly, in sticks. Uh, so sometimes the mapping is, is not that clear and we have a massive table of what maps to, the, to, to what. Uh, but objects and attributes can express a lot of different things. One of the crazier use cases that we're seeing, for example, by border control, 
is expressing, for example, passenger information or car plate information via attributes and objects. So obviously, there is no mapping to sticks in those cases. Same thing, for example, when uh, from our own domain, when we're dealing with uh, with uh, ransomware cases, and we're descri uh, describing the payment wallets used for the uh, uh, ransom, uh, then those would end up in financial indicators as part of attributes or objects in this. I hope that somewhat answers it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe an addition to that and uh, uh, where it's coming from, because it, it's coming really from, from the background of the specific activities. Uh, very often we have um, indicators uh, and that are coming back and forth into infrastructure from the attacker. Sometimes, for example, it's, it's going back to a parking page, it's not anymore uh, um, an attribute, and then it's more unobservable. Um, so that's why we have this kind of simple com com concept in MISP, where it's basically just a flag to set. Uh, and to, to decide uh, at some point in time, because we have seen a lot of evolution over time of infrastructure from attackers and so on, where uh, the information is, is pretty dynamic and, and coming from observable to indicators and going back from indicators to observables on a regular basis. Uh, so that's why we have this on a DS flag, uh, which is for us much more easier to, to tackle. Uh, and that's why we, we sometimes even attach the side things aspect on it uh, to see the evolution of such kind of thing. I hope it answers your questions, Ken. Okay, uh, going back to it, um, Sam, did you create your object already with the file? No, not yet. Okay, so just quickly, just create. Let's just create a file object. One of the things that's good that you highlighted that because I forgot about that. Now these templates come with some rules attached. So you see, you have a bunch of different things that you can fill out. Obviously, not everything is mandatory, but some might be required. So whenever we're creating templates for MISP for these objects, we define what the bare minimum is for it to be a valid file object, for it to be a valid domain IP object, and so on. So that's the one thing that you have to keep in mind when you're encoding information. Uh, make sure that the mandatory fields are, uh, are set, otherwise you will get an error message that tells you to fill that out. Uh, but just something to keep in mind. So yeah, let's just pick something there. Perfect. Let's submit our file. When you click on submit, MIS will basically show you um, uh, what um, uh, the object will look like once we create it. At this point, you can still say, oh, damn, I left some stuff out. I can go back and review the data, or you can finalize it by creating, uh, clicking on create new object. Now we have our second object created. As you can see here, we did not start with some flat attributes that we combined, but we started immediately from the object. So this already gave us uh, also a bit, uh, a bit of ease of use, basically, because it showed us what, what attribute types might be expected by the object. And then we just filled out the, uh, the template uh, based on what we knew. Uh, generally, it's a good rule of thumb. The more you know and the more you share, the better, because even if you're not using certain data points, if you have that information at hand, usually re recovering that information during the analysis process when you have access to your logs, when you have access to all the other tools that are reporting uh, the data back to you, is much easier than figuring it out after the fact by a third party. So better to encode whatever you know about the data point uh, that goes into the object template rather than uh, going for the bare minimum. Now, what we have here is now we have a list of attributes and a list of objects. They already give us quite a bit of context on, on what belongs together, but we still don't know, for example, how this file interacted with the domain IP. So we still don't know the story behind what happened here. So this is when we can start drawing a graph out of our data points that we've created. So you can either do it on tabular form. We, we're not gonna go deeply into that because it's much better to just do it from the graph anyway, but you could do it from here and select what you're linking the data point to, but let's skip that. And let's just go to the graph instead. It's much more useful. So we go to the event graph. And here what we have is two buckets, basically. One of our buckets contains our unreferenced attributes and the other the unreferenced objects. So far, nothing has been uh, connected, so to say. So these are free floating data points and we can start creating links from them. So we have that domain IP and that file object there. So let's just say that that uh, file object connects to that domain IP. All you have to do is click on the edit mode. So you go into the edit mode uh, on your graph add a reference, and then draw a line from one object to the other. Then this will bring up this dialog where we can add a relationship type for the two. So in this case, we can just say connects to. Okay, so just something simple. We can even add a comment if we want, but let's not do that now. 
And now we have a graph of those two data points. We can also take those attributes and we can further make connections from our objects to the attributes. So we could say that, for example, that file also connects, for example, to the, I don't know, pick something. Dot <laughs> com, <laughs> perfect. Now there is one uh, the, one thing to keep in mind here that MIST doesn't do is it does not allow you to create relationships for, between individual attributes. So in order to, to be used as the root node for a connection, it has to be an object. So one of the things, that, so this is another advantage while you should always try to encode objects as well, because it allows you more easily to build graphs out of the data points in the end. An object can still reference a free, free floating attribute, but not the other way around. But the idea is, uh, using using this uh, uh, tool, we basically want to tell the story by building the full uh, range of different objects that are interlinked with each other that reads quite easily as a sentence in the end. So in this case, we see that, that myfile.pdf connects to that domain IP and so on and so forth. We're going to see some good examples uh, afterwards. And when you're encoding um, uh, your events for the exercise, keep this in mind as well. Okay, so that's basically it for creating our attributes and their objects. At this point, we have all the technical data, so to say, encoded in the data, but we still haven't labeled anything. We haven't contextualized our data. Uh, so let's start doing that. And first, before we dive into that, a quick explanation of the different context layers that we have in MISP. We basically have two ways of contextualizing data. One we call tags. These are coming from standardized libraries called taxonomies. So as an example of the tags that we see here, we see TLP white on there. Now TLP white comes from the TLP taxonomy and it, it, uh, it in particular uses the white setting of the TLP taxonomy. Uh, so if you hover over it, you get an explanation over what TLP white actually means. Uh, but this is one of those more generally understood concepts. Now, on the other hand, if you wanted to describe something more rich and where you want to include additional data points references to articles, and so on and so forth, then you would use another system called galaxy clusters. The naming convention is a little bit funky, but consider it as knowledge base elements that are coming from a library that you can attach to either individual data points or to an entire event. Now, the source of these knowledge bases are first of all, the, the open source community's standardized uh, repository, but you can also create your own. For example, a typical use case for galaxy clusters is threat actor information. So threat actors typically are what we store in galaxy clusters. So as an example, if we would take Sophocy, for example, that for us is a galaxy cluster in the threat actor galaxy. So as you can see there, it is a bunch of different synonyms attached that we could use, and they would also allow us to search for this specific cluster. So now we've attached that to the event and we have a bunch of different data points for it. So if we pivot over to its view, mm -hmm. then we see that we have a lot of data points uh, uh, assigned to Sophocy. So we have a description and below we have a bunch of other data points from CFR, uh, for example, about suspected victims, motivations and so on, as well as references to articles, suspected country and so on and so forth. Uh, so as you can see, this is a pretty uh, rich library of different data points that we can use as a label now to attach to our data. Now, again, it, means, it doesn't mean that you have to use the standardized library that we have. If you want to create your own threat actor library, or if you want to fork individual values, you can do that as well, but we won't go into too much depth in, uh, on, on that topic right now. But you can absolutely manage and uh, publish your own Galaxy cluster through MISP as well. Something else that we use uh, this quite happily to describe besides your threat actors are a bunch of different other concepts. For example, MITRE attacks, uh, uh, different attacker techniques are also contained for us in a galaxy cluster. So just as a quick uh, uh, showing of that, how that works. Hmm. Yeah, maybe on the event, yeah. Let's atta attach an attacker, uh, an attack technique. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, so this brings us uh, up to a view that looks similar to the attack navigator. We can select the techniques that apply to this event and just label the event with those techniques. So let's just pick something, yeah. 
And now we, we get the same metadata about, uh, about, in this case, the brute force technique as well. So if we click on the little magnifying glass, we get a description that is coming straight from Mitre's library about what this specific uh, pattern entails. You can also create relationships between these different uh, galaxy clusters. So for example, if you're encoding uh, information about a threat actor, you can link a threat actor to known abused attack patterns, for example, or you can link it to, uh, to target uh, sectors, target countries, for example. So you can create full relationships between the different uh, um, uh, galaxy clusters themselves. And then when you're attaching the galaxy cluster to the uh, event, then you see those links directly already showing up there as well. So here's some example with, uh, with some uh, similarities between different uh, 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 attackers uh, or atta uh, attack groups in this case. Okay. Now let's go back to our event. We could also add, uh, add this, uh, these labels, both tags and galaxies on the individual data points. And this is something where you always have to make this decision. When I'm describing an attack pattern, for example, does it apply to everything in this event or only to certain points? Is especially for those of you working on the exercise right now, the exercise contains a longer flow of events, basically, or not events, but of actions. And those actions all abuse different attack patterns, for example. So that would mean that labeling the entire event is a little bit ambiguous if you would uh, label the entire thing with the attack patterns because only certain parts are affected by the attack pattern of the data that you're sharing there so in that case it's better to ap uh, apply to the individual attributes so if i were if i wanted to label for example those first three attributes in there in the file object i could select all three attributes with the multi selector on the left and i could just attach a galaxy cluster to them so i could uh, pick an attack pattern Perhaps, yeah. And just say that these are all, I don't know, pick something, whatever. Oops. There we go. So uh, so we see that they're, they're all dealing with our cache poisoning in this case. Uh, now, generally, when we're thinking about inheritance in MISP, everything that we label on the event by default applies to all the contents within. Unless, of course, you have an, uh, an opposite uh, tag attached. So that means that if we label the event TLP white, but we label an individual attribute TLP ember, for example, then we would consider the entire event to be TLP white, except for that one attribute that is TLP ember. So instead of labeling every single attribute with TLP white, uh, we just label the event with a single uh, flag in this case, uh, or a single tag, and the single attribute that will be TLP ember separately. Now, there is something that is a little bit confusing here, just a small side note, if you're already a MISP user, you might be uh, surprised by this. We have two ways of attaching galaxy clusters and tags always, there are two buttons there. One is called a global tag and the other is called a local tag. The difference between the two is that local will stay as a, 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 a label on your instance only. So the moment you synchronize this out, that label will get stripped and data is, is uh, shared without it. We generally use this for flow control, for example. That means if we have a MISP instance that acts as a node for a larger community with different MISP instances, we can, for example, say that we only share this data out if it has a certain label attached to it. And then we use this local uh, tag to decide, okay, now it is ready to flow in that direction, for example. So, uh, so that's one of the typical use cases for it. Another caveat there, whenever you're making a modification to an event, it gets unpublished in general. But if you attach a local tag, that is not the case because we don't consider that as a modification of the data. It's only a local flow control tag. Okay. Now let's just add a few more. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Once you're done with all of this and once you have created your event, you have contextualized all your data points and you have created a nice graph that tells a story uh, with your data points, then it is ready to publish the event. So in this case, we have different. Uh, we we, uh, we can click on publish event, which will go through this entire publication process. So let's talk a little bit about what would happen in that case. First of all, as mentioned before, events are not actionable until the point where it is published. The moment it is published, your different tools that are drawing their data out of MISP will suddenly be able to receive that information. 
On top of that, MISP will start propagating the data to other MISP nodes as long as the distribution rules allow for it. So if you, we've selected all communities, for example, or connected communities, and our different uh, labeling filters uh, allow it, then data would start flowing at this moment. MISP will also start sending out emails. So there is this, uh, MISP has a, an emailing system that basically sends out encrypted emails to everyone that subscribes to publish alerts. Um, for those of you that are using this for a longer time and when they're looking for some advanced options there, you can even select rules on what gets public, uh, what publish alerts you receive. So if you're only interested in certain topics, you can dis uh, define filters uh, for the publish alerts. But anyway, MISP will decide who's eligible for the publish alert based on these different rules and better you subscribe to the list in the first place. And if you are, then it will send out an encrypted email at the moment when you do the publishing. Finally, MISP will also start propagating the information through other channels. So we have some channels that you can, uh, that allow us to subscribe other, other tools to MISP data uh, using 0MQ, Kafka, uh, Syslog, and I think something else that I forgot about. Uh, but anyway, so if you have tools connected by any of these channels, the moment that the data is published, they will also receive the information. So when you click publish, the entire process is done and data is propagated, the email starts flowing and so on. And the published state will change to, yes, there we go. Now, if at this point you, re you realize that you've made a typo somewhere and you want to modify it, for example, we see that uh, that it's called demo event for FirstCon 21, but let's assume that we were already in 22 and we wanted to rectify that. We would edit the event. We would make the, the modification to that, or just a dash. <laughs> and then we see that our event is no longer published. So that means MISP puts the event into unpublished state the moment any modification is done to the event. So we have to republish it. Keep in mind, that this also means that if you have one of those workflows where analysts can encode data and someone needs to vet the data, someone would again have to vet this event. And the reason for that is that we consider any modification uh, to be grounds for, uh, for having to check it up again. You might have included additional new information. That information might contain personal information that you don't want to share out. It's a good idea to do, go through the entire publication process again. Once you're happy with it and you click publish, what will happen is the data will flow out again, update all the instances that have the data and that are eligible to get the modifications. And then uh, uh, we're back to a stage where we can automate it again. The annoying thing though is it will also alert everyone with an email of the change happening to this event. Now in this case, all we've done is we've added a dash to the info field, no need to alert everyone about this. So we can just publish without an email in this case. There is also another way of publishing the data using something called delegation, but we're not going to go deeply into that now because we're running a bit short on time for that. Um, but just as a quick explanation, it allows us to basically share the data so that, um, uh, that we entrust a third party to do the, the publishing for us. So if I, for example, created some data, but I didn't want my name attached to it, then I could ask Sami, for example, or Sami's organization to publish it under their name. So yeah, let's just quickly show it, yeah. Okay. Once, once we've done this, uh, the other party can accept the, the delegation request and then they would publish it under their own name. There is a question. Uh, so the question is, once we create an event and realize that a lot of added attributes relate to other events previously added, what would be the best way to export uh, all related events? Okay. So if you see that, uh, that it relates to, to a lot of other data, I mean, you have to find some way of, of expressing that. Correlations in themselves show us that there are similarities, but if you want to confirm that, you can, for example, use tags to, uh, to create a label for a campaign, or a certain uh, threat actor or something that binds those events together. Another option is something called extended events, where if we see that our event relates very closely to something that was described, what we can do, uh, maybe it's better to show it while we would edit it at this point. If you, we just click on edit event, we could select the event that, uh, that we're extending in this case with our own information and just paste the ID of that event in there. So yeah, just pick something. I think the question was more on the export 
to is to export all the related events. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Which just, we need to first create a link so it's easier to export those things together. So in, the, so in this case, we either have had now an extended event or we labeled it, them together so that they're easier searched for the exports. Um, but we've now grouped these events together in one of the two ways, basically. And now at this point, indeed, in order to export this data, we have different options. One of them is to use the API of MISP, that is the most flexible basically out there. Uh, we have a built-in REST client that allows us to build API queries. So let's just have a very quick look. It's no longer there, yeah, indeed. <laughs> Uh, where we can basically just use an API endpoint called REST search. This allows us to run searches against our system, um, search for various different tags, search for various different other rules, and then export them in one of the different formats that we want. So let's assume that we use a tag to label our, our two events or three events that we found that are similar, which for example, a threat actor is label. It doesn't really matter, we just put whatever. So we're just showing the example. Then we could use the tag um, uh, filter here, or tags, yeah. Maybe tag works as well, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> we would say anchor, for example, in this case, that, that we've picked as a tag. Uh, and this, what this would do now is, it, don't forget to check, check uh, show results, is basically uh, generate, uh, oh, it won't work because you need to place your API key. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would basically generate the output in the in, in the format that you choose so if you wanted to have for example a, a sticks export format of all the data that matches your search results then you would say sticks or sticks to as the return format if you wanted to generate a csv out of it you would ask for a csv and so on so this is one of the ways of doing it let's quickly run the example so here we go. Now we have a JSON with all of our events returned. Or if you wanted to create a CSV out of it, it's as simple as basically changing the parameter of re return format to CSV. I shouldn't have clicked on JSON. <laughs> it's trying to pass the whole blob. <laughs> too much data, I think, for <laughs> pretty printing it. <laughs> okay. Now. It Oops. <laughs> <laughs> An ambitious try, yeah. Uh, anyway, there is another way of doing it. So if you just want to export all the data points from all those events, you can also do it via the interface not relying on the REST client with a tool called search as oh, no, search attributes. Now you want the data point only. Yeah, exactly. So the question was if you find that, uh, that yeah. several things relate together. So you can, for, you, again, use tags. You can use a list of event IDs. If you found that there's four other events that correlate, you can also pick their IDs and paste those in here. So whichever way you want to, uh, to use to combine the data set that you want to export. And then all you have to do is just click Submit here afterwards. It doesn't really matter now, but yeah, you can add whatever. Uh, uh, what was it, Encore? Yeah, exactly. The exact same uh, thing is done by Pym. So Pymis search function uh, uses REST search under the hood. So it's the same parameter as what you can use on, on the REST client for the search. You can use via Pymis as well. So indeed, uh, for those of you that, that wanted to, to script and develop tools that search MISP, use Pymis, and it's a, it's a Python library that, uh, that does a lot of the heavy lifting of building these queries and uh, knowing the conventions of MISP. So generally, it's, it will make it a lot easier. Now, what we've seen here is we, Sami now searched uh, for, for the same thing what we've seen in the other uh, uh, query. So we're using our anchor tag again to search for data. And we can also directly use the search results from the attribute list to also download all this data. So we can also download S and then select the format that you want to export it in. So if you wanted to have, I don't know, uh, snort rules out of it or CSV out of it, we would just have to download that. Okay. There's maybe something in addition because I think in the question there's maybe an addition mm -hmm. strategy that might be of interest. Uh, when you add it, a lot of attributes, you might see a lot of related events. And in the uh, API, when you use uh, the search on events for a specific uh, uh, event, you can get the related event. 
and the related events are the uh, correlating one, and then you can pivot from that one to do an export with PyMisp. Uh, then. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Okay, good. So I think that's pretty much it for the quick introduction, or at least for everything that we need to get started with the. Maybe a quick look into the event report. Yep, that's a good point, Sam. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so you've seen that you can create attributes, you can create objects. Uh, but for example, if you want to express uh, or to include a report into your event, uh, you might think that it's, uh, you could do it by just creating an attribute of type text and putting the, all the text of the report inside it, but it's not really convenient uh, for user to read it, but also for analysts to express uh, well, what they want to say with this report. So similar to the, to the event graph that we have uh, here in, the, in this bar, we also have the event report, uh, which is basically just uh, a, a, a text file that you can save that belongs to an event. So for example, let, let's create one quickly so that we can see what it looks like. Demo uh, event report. Uh, then you would put the content of, of this report. Uh, this interface is not really designed to do it. It's just a quick way to create the, uh, the report. So let's try uh, test data. So now we've created our report, which does not contain much. But the cool thing that we can do now is we can explore this, uh, this event report. And if we own it, we can also edit it uh, with an editor that supports uh, that support, uh, Markdown. So you could say that uh, you also want to uh, have, uh, you could put some uh, special titles. So it, it really supports uh, almost uh, all the, the markdown feature with some of them disables, for example, pictures by default so that you don't leak uh, whenever you fetch the picture. But basically you have access to a full markdown editor, uh, a full markdown uh, viewer. And you can also have the split screen if, you, if, you, if you'd like to, to work on this report and see the instantaneous result. So you can also obviously include stables, uh, some code and so on. But the, the most interesting thing, it's not actually uh, this uh, uh, rendering, it's the fact that you can also reference uh, objects and attributes and contexts like tags and galaxies from this event into the report. So we've seen previously that you can have uh, a graph uh, that can express a uh, uh, a story behind things. So for example, that my file is connected to domain IP. Uh, obviously, it's always good to encode it that way, but you can also express it verbally with this. So you can also reference these object and attribute uh, that belongs to an event via this button. So for example, this one will create a reference to an attribute. And then you have a suggestion that you can pick. So these are all the attributes that belong to this, to this event. So let's say that you want to, to express that uh, uh, my file is uh, connecting to, and then you can also say another attribute to the, I don't know which one was it, I think it was Google to Google. And then automatically you can build uh, and have a, a render version of it where it's also interactive. So you can click on, on, on these and have uh, more information. Uh, so in that case, we reference attribute that belong to an object, but of course you can also reference an, a full object itself. So for example, the whole file uh, and same for row attributes, uh, attributes such as a row IP address. So you can see in the first case, this is a row IP address. So like a standard attribute, you can also reference full object uh, by just uh, uh, supplying the UID of the object or using the suggestion box, or you can also reference attribute inside an object. So for example, the myfile.pdf is actually this attribute, which is contained inside the file object. So that's why you have this uh, special highlighting. Uh, and of course, you can also reference the different tags that are contained into, in, inside this event. So for example, TLP Ember, 
uh, and also uh, same for uh, for example the, the different galaxies that we have so for example we also reference Sophia as a trade actor so we can see that you you get the, the correct tag with the correct colors same for uh, the galaxy the rendering is done correctly uh, and and finally you can also include uh, all the 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 galaxy matrices uh, that are contained inside the event so for example the attack matrix uh, this one is what we call a galaxy matrix so we can also uh, include it into the into the report I'm just clicking on the this uh, encyclopedia sign and then you choose you can choose which which one you want to to have so this is the attack pattern one and then it will uh, fetch all the the detail and recreate it so once you're happy with it you can save it and oops just wanted to reload the page so that you can see that we have it was this one yep and there we go so you, you have the, the whole report uh, and it's also interactive so you can click on it and see the the details uh, uh, of uh, of this misp element all right, so if you, if you want more information of uh, all the possibilities that you can do with this uh, event report, there, there is an L button that explains the, the syntax, what it supports, uh, some shortcut, the, the plugin supported by the, the editor. Uh, you, you can also download it in PDF or Markdown where it will strip the, the different uh, uh, syntax reference. So instead of having, for example, this at attribute and then the UID of the, the the attribute it's not really convenient because you don't really know what it means it will convert it back to uh, the attribute value type and category yeah, all right something else is to show an example of one that is completed so if you can just give it over to that that's a good point so i will grab this one so this is also a huge event uh, but you can see what what you can have. So the, this is uh, this was in fact a blog post coming from uh, a website. Uh, I think we even have the the original one encoded. Uh, if we don't, that's uh, that's a shame because we, we should. So, sorry, it was at the bottom. I missed it. It was there. It was there. Yeah, I missed it. Ah yes, that, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So it's not fully encoded, but it, it gives a nice overview. So it, it explains what what, it, what this Cobalos malware does and so on, it provides some pictures, uh, conclusion, and then the attack uh, techniques. And if we look at what we have, it's basically the same, but encoded as Markdown. And this one is shared uh, across the different MISP instances. And it's also interactive where if you don't really know what Cobalos is, you can click on it and then get some references. Uh, it, it can also support picture inclusion into the into the report. Uh, some references to the different uh, attributes and objects that are contained inside the event, the different matrix attack techniques, and the and the final result with the the, the matrix, the galaxy matrix of the matrix attack framework. Maybe yeah. it was to, it was to mention that it's going in, in both ways, so either creation and both. Yeah, yeah ab ab absolutely. Um, so I will just refresh this page and go back to our example. So um, let's say that in, in the report you have, uh, we'll just reopen it. Whoops, there we go. Let's go split screen. Uh, you have the, the raw IP address uh, that has already been encoded into the event. Uh, Oops, so we just save, save it, yes. What you can do, so, so we can see in the report we have, we just remove the, the matrix because it's, it's quite big. Oops, yes. So you can see that you have the textual way, but if you want to convert it into an existing entity that already exists in, in the event, you can go in menu, extract entities and then manual extraction. And then what, what it will do, it will apply a bunch of regexes uh, in, uh, for this document. 
uh, and propose you different things. So for example, you have access to the data replacement and you can see that it detected that this IP address already exists in the, in the event. And so it proposes you to replace it um, with the actual reference. So if you click on replace and save, Uh, and then we go back to our editor. We can see that the IP address has been converted to uh, the actual reference, uh, uh, this one. So referencing this attribute. Uh, but it also can go the other way around. So if, for example, you have an IP address that does not exist in the event yet, uh, just need to save it each time, of course. Uh, can go on manual extraction. And then data replacement, we don't have anything anymore because this one does not exist in the event yet. Uh, but if we go in uh, data extraction, we can see that it detected that it, it is a, a valid IP address. So we can click on it and then click on extract and save. And what it will do, it will take this value, convert it into an attribute, save it into the event, and then add a reference to it. So if we look back to our event, we'll see that we created a new IP address. Just need to reload the page. So we can, you can see that we created a new IP address. Uh, and so it, it can be uh, very uh, useful to, for example, just paste uh, a whole blog post or uh, 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 a large text that you want to process and then extract the attribute manually from, from here. It also supports context. Uh, so if I put some tags that MISP knows about, I can also go extract entities, manual extraction. And then I have context replacement. And you can see that it detected correctly uh, this one, uh, this tag. So it proposed uh, to do the replacement. So I'm not sure why it didn't detect this one. Uh, most probably because it's the parsing is not go done correctly. Uh, but yeah. most of the time, oh, no, no, I know why. Because it's not part of a taxonomy. Yeah, so small caveat, uh, you can only replace tags that belongs to either a taxonomy or a MIPS galaxy. Otherwise, you, you would have way, way too many false positives for this. Uh, so if you were to, to, to have some specific uh, uh, techniques, for example, they would be picked automatically and a replacement would be uh, proposed. Uh, uh, maybe I can, I can add some, some use cases where, because mm -hmm. when we did this, we, we didn't know what will be the use case of all the users and so on. Re recently, we saw two interesting use cases. Um, one, which is, I think, for me, it was initially kind of a stretch, but at the end, it's a good idea. Um, they were sharing a screenshot of PowerPoint uh, in the event. Uh, so um, what they did is basically they split the uh, PowerPoint into a screenshot. Those one are attributes, uh, object in list with the uh, uh, screenshot. Then they use even report to reference the uh, PowerPoint. And then they add text around with reference to additional objects and so on. Um, so I think it was a clever way. Uh, so we never thought about that one, but it was a clever way to use the even report to inject, for example, a PowerPoint for further analysis inside this and it could even share it. So that's one way of using it, which was like, I would say unknown to us, but it, it's clever. The second one that we, we, we have seen, and this one is another uh, way of, of doing it, it's when multiple people are using MISP on the same event. So what they did is um, they have to translate. So for example, uh, uh, you have to translate a large uh, report. So you have multiple people working on it, but some people are doing the structure import with a script and so on. At the same time, someone is doing the event report. And then they were, what they were doing is, regular ping pong between the extractions. So, okay, you did that object and so on. So you discover those one and you can add into the uh, reference uh, event report. So it's, it's open to plenty of functionalities. Uh, I see that uh, uh, Mr. Spatial uh, had this idea of having LaTeX too, and uh, that's maybe one of the plugins that we, we were uh, looking at. One of the things that we, we, are, we were um, thinking of is using Mermaid. Uh, Mer Mermaid is a JavaScript library to uh, describe uh, graph relationship, uh, things like that, or even workflow and things like that, uh, to include that into, uh, into the report. So again, we, we saw more and more people using it. It's, it's one of those latest features in MISP. Uh, so we'll see, I think, more people uh, using it and uh, uh, to, uh, 
to to use it on a, on a day to day basis. So, uh, and uh, what I heard already for the exercise, at least one of the uh, participants of the session of today already did some uh, even report uh, out of the exercise. So um, you, you, we can see uh, later on some some use case on on, on using it uh, during this uh, email exercise. A uh, thing that we didn't cover, but we might cover afterwards, is uh, uh, sightings and event timeline uh, that we can uh, show later, because the event timeline is super interesting, especially when you start to add information. So you have seen that uh, Sami was navigating through, through MISP, creating objects as reviews, and very often you have this box of first in last scene. Uh, any object attribute in MISP as a first in last scene functionality, like, like he was uh, he's showing there. Uh, if you don't set it by default, you end up into this kind of, of uh, uh, time of when you enter the data. But nevertheless, if you have details about first in last in, fill it. It's super interesting because afterwards, MISP can do much more with it. Uh, and one of the use cases there is, is to uh, have a, uh, an event timeline that's automatically built out of uh, out of the data there. And you can see we, we have some, some nice example in, in the training uh, MISP to show that. Uh, if you want to, to go into the event timeline, maybe uh, yeah. to show, yeah. Sure, just wanted to, to show that. You don't see the first scene and last scene at the, in this table. If you want to see that, you have to click on the context, context button, then it will appear because it takes a lot of place. Uh, but the, the most convenient way to see it is by clicking on the event timeline button. It will open up a widget that allows you to, to browse uh, whatever uh, has a first in and last in set. Uh, so all, all the ones that have a red border uh, do not have uh, last in and first in set, but all the others have one. So I think we can, uh, can hide them. Uh, and then you can also uh, play, play with the timeline and drag and, uh, drag and drop the different uh, attribute to, to have them uh, or to adapt uh, the first in or last in uh, to, to whatever you'd like. And, and it's really, it really, uh, it's really uh, useful and useful when, when, when you are working on specific cases. Uh, you know that I'm a bit crazy about passive DNS, for example. Uh, if you do an export from a passive DNS uh, record set, for example, you can have a full timeline of all the records that you get of the passive DNS without doing any, you know, manual work of entering timestamp and so on because it's coming automatically from the system. So it's, it's, it's really nice and, and useful. Um, we, we, we have seen a lot of people using it for forensic analysis when they want to build a timeline of uh, sequence of events regarding file creation, so file deletion, and things like that. And if you have already the data set through the API, uh, you can you can say that. Uh, Mira has a good question too regarding the um, automatic report creation, so mapping and so on. Uh, I think everything is exposed through the API. Uh, maybe Sami, you want to dig more into that? So what was the question? Automatic report creation or mapping? Yeah. So. That's a, that's a good point. So you can see that you have multiple ways to create a report. So the first one is to do it manually. So to add a name to the report, a distribution level, and then its content. Uh, the second one is to import it directly from an URL. So what we can do is to try again with this one. So if you have an URL, for example, this block, and you want to import it and convert it into a MISP uh, uh, event report, you can click on this import from URL button, then paste the URL, click on submit and what, we, what it will do, it will go in, go and download the content, the HTML content of this URL, tries more or less to convert it into markdown. This is not an easy process, especially when web page are rendered with JavaScript. But anyway, it will do its best to, to uh, convert it into markdown. And then you have access to the content uh, that you can uh, play with it. So you can see that this can be removed. This can be transformed into a table. So obviously you, you need to to add a, a bit of uh, formatting to, to this uh, output, but it's a great start already. So you can already work on it and try to extract the different thing. So you can either do the extraction manually. So I've, as I've shown previously, you can see we have a bunch of context replacement. Uh, we have some data extraction that are available that you could do right away. Uh, but if you, if you want, or if you are lazy, you can also click on automatic extraction. And what this one will do, it will just automatically extract everything. So all the context and all the uh, uh, all the, the data that it can find. So basically everything that is listed here will be converted into attributes and all the context that is here will be converted into right, 
context. So the event will be tagged with all of these. So we will probably have a, a lot of uh, false positives. For example, this one, you don't really want to have them converted. So that's why I prefer to go to the manual way. But if you are really lazy and want to apport modification later on, you can obviously do it. Uh, for example, this one, you can see that it will replace all the Cobalos keyword by the associated tag. So uh, we can have a look at what it does. If you click on automatic, uh, you can also add, ask to, to tag the event with what we found. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. We have too many correlation then. And then it will start processing and do the, the conversion. So you can see that the, the report has been converted. Uh, and if we go back to the event, we will see that we created new, new attributes. So I will remove them so that we don't have too many uh, correlation with other. Uh, yeah, I think Miran is mentioning something else and it's, it's a tool from, um, from uh, my trade called Tram. Um, where Tram was basically analyzing text in a natural language processing to extract more the attack uh, things. So to, to relief out of a sentence to uh, create either the relationship or even to deduce the techniques that it mentioned. Um, we don't support that right now. Uh, well, nevertheless, if the attack uh, ID is mentioned or technique ID and so on is mentioned, it will be automatically extracted. It works out of the box. Uh, the, the stuff that um, Maitre was doing was a bit more complex and more advanced because they were really doing natural language processing and so on. Indeed, Tram seems to be a bit like on old projects. Um, and um, met, uh, in, in the future, so doing an extension in uh, the event report, uh, in, in, we, we might, for example, have uh, extension like Promise modules, things like that for yeah. the event report. So that's, uh, that's a good idea. Maybe we could create an issue for that. It's a good feedback uh, uh, to go on, the, on, the, on that one. Uh, so there, is, yeah. there is a specific note. Uh, yeah, maybe for, from yeah. Kuhn, basically. In the, indeed, one of the things that we, the, everything we're showing now, including the event report creation, all the data creation, and so on, these are all exposed to the API. So Kuhn cur uh, currently, but sadly, Kuhn, it's only visible to us, not to the rest of the group, is um, uh, that you can indeed use this via PyMISP, and you can basically um, uh, use PyMISP to instruct MISP to grab a report from a URL and to generate the report completely automatically. So if you want to, uh, to completely automate this in, initial ingestion of the uh, part of the process, you can absolutely do that. Uh, for, for, I, can, I can mention an example of, uh, I will not name the vendor, but I know one vendor doing that. So they, they do uh, trade intelligent reports, kind of more strategic intelligent reports uh, for their customer and they provide a misconnector where they inject the report, which is a, a complete PDF document into the markdown format. So they really use the markdown format with all the descriptions and have the comp complementary one. So if you operate MISP and you have already strategic reports and so on, using the bridging with the event report is a very nice way to uh, distribute the information uh, to have a re reliability that is bound to the sharing group, for example, things like that, and then attach the associated uh, structure information to it. So, uh, it's indeed, uh, so it's a good point, Kuhn, indeed, that uh, Having this such kind of gener generation and pushing into MISP is, is providing a lot of uh, nice way of sharing information and even collaboration on, on, on the event report. I, I think we can wrap up this part of uh, creating it because we're running a bit low on time. Uh, so uh, let's insert a break for now. And then when we come back, what we're going to do is we're going to start encoding a, a, an event. And we're going to show uh, to show you uh, how we, we would basically approach the idea of encoding uh, the exercise uh, email. Uh, and then at the very end of the session, we're going to look at some of the events that are created and talk a little bit about that. So shall we say uh, 10 minute break? It was plan 15, but 10 is great too. We will be behind, I think, no? but, but we can do 15 if you want. So what we can do, we can start at uh, 45. Like, like yeah, 45. 45. So. Okay. So see, see you in a minute and 45. <laughs> Take care. We'll see you all at 45. Okay. I think it's time to pick it up again. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, so now uh, let's have a quick look at, uh, at how we would approach the issue uh, that, that we had in that little exercise. 
So let's go back to that and I encourage everyone to have a look at the um, HDoc uh, uh, URL from before so that we can have a look at the actual exercise email. Yeah, maybe before we, we start, uh, I just want to share a, a, a cheat sheet with the attendees uh, that can be useful, uh, especially because when we did this presentation, I guess we were quite fast on some concept. Uh, so for those who are new to, to MISP, this can be a bit confusing. So we have created a cheat sheet that uh, I, I will post the, the URL in the chat. Uh, so basically, it's a, it's a three sheet quick uh, cheat sheet that contains some general concept that we have in MISP. For example, what is an, what is an extended event? Uh, what is the uh, act of publishing? Uh, what is the act of delegating something? Uh, some general rules regarding the distribution and how far things can go in the uh, in the network of connected MISP instances. Uh, some more information about the synchronization. And on the second page, you have uh, the majority of the data model that are present in MISP, where you have the purpose of it, some use cases. For example, it's explained for events, attributes, objects, reference, sightings, event report, and so on. So all of these. Uh, it's a, it's a quick way to, to, remind, to, to, to remind you what, what it means, what it does, and how it can be used. And, and the last page is about some uh, 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 command and shortcut, especially via the API, but also for administrators. So how to do th uh, things that are usually done uh, when you have some issue, for example, how to reset the password, how to reset the brute force prote uh, protection, uh, updating the instance, managing workers, and so on. And for the user part, mainly the most common uh, uh, searches that you can do, basically. Uh, so feel free uh, to, to have a look and yeah. All right, that, that's it for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get to our exercise. Um, so let's have a quick look at, uh, and see what we're dealing with here. So we have an email here. That basically tells us about these details about uh, the attempted attack, pretending to be the uh, teacher of the CEO's daughter. So we see here already that we have a bunch of different data points already in the initial attack vector. We see an email that was spoofing an email address. We see that the email was received from a, a certain uh, email provider. So we have both the domain as well as the IP address. And we see that there was a malicious file contained in the initial email code, this is not malicious.exe, which we can also find in the attachment further below. Uh, we also see that, um, uh, and, uh, that this was retrieved from a certain uh, host so that is also an IPv6 address. And it looks like this, uh, uh, and this init initial malicious file tried to uh, exploit a vulnerability that is uh, identified by CVE 2015 before 65. And, uh, and after the triage, so it looks like the attack was not successful. However, uh, there was an analysis on what this payload would have done. Uh, it would have uh, connected to a hard-coded C2 to download a secondary payload, uh, and then use that secondary payload to exfiltrate local credentials. Uh, we also have something interesting else in here that you will see very often, so we'll get back to this in a moment that basically they ask us not to share this further with anyone else because it's an ongoing investigation and that we should basically avoid doing active research on the data points there so that we don't alert the attacker that they have been burned. So let's start with including this information now in this. So as a first uh, uh, point, we're going to uh, create a new event. Oh, sorry, yeah. it's better if you show it. Uh, you don't you don't see my screen? Yeah, I do. I do. I do oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's start with a, with an explanation that gives us an idea of what we're dealing with here. So spear phishing targeting um, uh, telco company in Luxembourg, for example, uh, would be an, an easy uh, explanation. This doesn't. This already tells us what sort of an attack we're dealing with here. So it's a spear phishing. You already know that we're dealing with a telco company and that we know that we're targeting uh, an organization in Luxembourg, if you add that to the end of the line, the telco company in Luxembourg. Oh, sorry. I can put it if you want to, sure. <laughs> yeah, so, so that you have, have, have it. 
Now, initially, it's a good idea. We're dealing with something that is sensitive here. So what, before we're done with encoding data, let's keep it internal for now. So we're going to select your organization only. Let's start creating our event. And now we can uh, basically uh, go through uh, uh, the different data points as they happened. Uh, so that means that uh, we can basically now look at uh, our uh, initial email and we can see that initially it all started uh, with an initial email. So let's start encoding an email uh, directly in this. We can do it in two uh, different ways. One is basically we copy the entire text of the email and we drop it into uh, the free text importer to rip out everything that, uh, that it can find. That usually saves us a little bit of time. So let's start with that perhaps. Okay. So let's just paste the entire thing in there. Perfect. Let's see what we find here. So here we see already a bunch of things that are uh, picked up. So we see the throwaway email provider. We see the um, uh, uh, email address of the person that is being impersonated. We also see that um, uh, who we got the email from and so on. So in this case, for example, one of the things that we can exclude completely is that the email uh, uh, source for the email that we got as a report. So CSER to Telco tell you, we don't need to keep that as uh, an attribute in, in our event. The other ones we will most likely use. So let's just save it for now and we do our massaging of this after the fact. So we keep it as it is right now. So let's have a look at what we have here. Oops, let's refresh. There we go. So let's start with our initial email. So what belongs to our initial email in this case? We see that uh, basically uh, it, uh, it was using a spoofed address, John Doe at luxembourg.edu. So we can take that one for sure. We include that one. And let's create an object out of these different uh, data points that would form the email. So let's select that. We also see that, uh, that uh, what else was included there that is interesting, uh, that throwaway email provider.com was used. So we can take that as well. And uh, what else? And uh, the, the IP address 137, yeah, that's it. So let's see if we can create an email object out of this. Oh, it, it's done there, yeah. Domain and IP. It fell down, 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 down. You want domain IP? No, no. Yeah, email, email. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so we'll describe something and we'll, we'll have to edit it. So it's only the from that, that will get saved. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Oh, we want it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the other ones didn't get picked up, but we can now add them manually as well. So we have an email that is coming from that address and it also contains an attachment. We can also add that uh, at later on as well. So we can actually already reference it by adding the attachment uh, directly to the template and saying that that was the attachment name of the file. Okay. I think it's easier if you just edit it, to be honest. No? You want to edit it, okay. The object, yeah. Yeah, so there, there should be an attachment. Oh, you're scrolling around way too fast for me. <laughs> attachment, yeah. yeah. So let's just put the name of the file. So that is, uh, uh, is um, or, uh, what, which one was it? Malicious attack. Yes, malicious attack. Okay, uh, we can also uh, so uh, encode subject and so on if you would have it. We don't at the moment, but we do have a, a date time, so we can set the time for uh, the first scene, last scene for the uh, for this one in particular, because we know it was on the third of February, two thousand twenty-one. Third, yeah, perfect. And we also know that it was at fifteen fifty-six. If you want to be more precise. <laughs> Okay, so we can create the, the email object out of this. That's, that's already sufficient information for us for now. And we already see that uh, that in this case, uh, uh, what was something went wrong, looks like. Yeah, I forgot to encode correctly the last scene. Okay. But it's not an issue, we can do it later on with the timeline. Okay, but uh, now you, you're missing the attachment. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, we, we, we can skip that for now and we'll do it later. 
Perfect. Okay. We also know, uh, see, uh, see immediately there that this email was impersonating someone. Maybe it's a good idea to encode it as well. So we could add an object uh, for a person in this case. Yeah, perfect. And, and we don't even uh, need to describe the name. It is enough to add the title in this case. So the title would be teacher of CEO's daughter in this case. You can add that. Or maybe there's a better field for it. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It's okay. Alias. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't need to go into too much detail for now. We could add John Doe if you wanted to fill it out. Because that was the name of the teacher in this case, but we can skip that for now. Okay, let's just create it. Ah, we have to have the name. Okay, so just at the first and last name. We have uh, John Doe as the name. But for this one, I just want to make sure that it stay internal. Exactly, so that's a good point. So the name in this case is irrelevant to most other folks outside of our uh, of those that are involved in the incident. So it's interesting to see that it's impersonating uh, 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 teacher CEO's daughter because that means that the attacker did research probably on uh, on the, the victim. So it's definitely something very targeted uh, the person. So that's interesting to include. Uh, the name uh, of the uh, actual person in this case, we can restrict to our own organization and not share that with anyone else. So let's submit. We now have the email and the, um, uh, the um, uh, person that is being, uh, or they're pretending to be encoded. Let's also add now the attachment. We haven't really talked about that, but you can also upload files in this directly. So let's have a quick look at that. We're going to offer to just grab the file from the uh, edge doc. Malicious.exe, there we go. We download it. And we're going to upload that uh, in MISP. So but when you have a button for adding attachments on the left side, and basically we differentiate between two different types of uh, attachments. One is basically attachments that we purely include as an additional uh, bit of information. Or we can add attachments where we really include malicious samples. So in this case, we're dealing with a malicious sample. So let, let's add that. Okay. Now, something else here. Um, uh, what Sami just did now quickly is he selected that this is going to be a malware sample and also to run advanced ex uh, extraction. That is currently not available at this instance, but we can, we can still explain what that does. What this would do is normally when we encode malicious samples in this, the file will not be directly attached to the event, but it will first be zipped. It will be password protected so, so that you don't accidentally execute it when you receive an event with the malicious samples. Uh, and we extract some additional information from that. If we don't have the advanced extraction installed or we don't run it, it basically will create a single file object with file hashes extracted, file size extracted, and so on included in the file object directly. However, if we do have the advanced extraction, then it will also dig, uh, drill down into the file, extract uh, PE headers and additional other information uh, that will be presented as a graph basically in the end. So it will create a bunch of different objects depending on the, on the file's complexity in that case. So with that in mind that the advanced extraction won't work now, let's just uh, add our file to the event. There we go. So now we have the file and code as well. And so we see we've extracted quite a bit of additional things like mime type and so on. So a bunch of different things were extracted from the file. Now, this is already a good starting point. We now have everything encoded about the initial email itself that we wanted. So we have the uh, email uh, object, we have the person that is being impersonated as well as the attachment encoded, but we still haven't really dealt with the infrastructure that was used uh, to, uh, to send this information to us. So we see an email provider and an IP address. So we can still create uh, an object out of that uh, combination as well. So it's a domain IP that we can convert those to uh, from, and we were still in the previous one. So there, the first one, throwawayemailprovider.com and the IP address, we can combine those into a domain IP pair. Okay. 
Perfect. So now that we know this, we also know that this uh, uh, initial payload tried to abuse a vulnerability. So we can add a vulnerability object or a vulnerability attribute, whichever we prefer. Let's go with an object for now, or, or we have an attribute, we can keep that, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, for simplicity's sake. Uh, now we also see that once this payload was installed, it basically connected uh, to a secondary uh, C2 where it received, retrieved an additional uh, payload that it installed or tried to install. So let's encode that information. We have the provider and we have an IPv6 address. So let's have a look if we have both of those in there already. We are, have both indeed, so we can create another domain IP to plot of those two. Mm. No? No, it's because it's an URL. Okay. This one is an URL. Okay, in that, uh, that case, uh, we can just uh, pick something else. Yeah, URL. You can take URL. Yeah, that's perfect. It works too. Indeed, it's not, it wasn't a domain. We had a full URL for the fact. Okay. Now, the next step that, uh, that did was it, it, it tried to connect out uh, to, uh, uh, to the C2, which is described further down. So let's also encode, uh, encode first of all, that domain IP tuple uh, in the bottom. Uh, and then we can start creating a graph out of all of this. So we already have those two there. So we create a domain IP or actually URL out of that because it's, it's not domain IP. Yeah, One yeah. thing that, that, it, that was missed here and that we can rectify in a moment. So let's first convert it. And then we see that the port was added as a comment when we did the ingestion. So we can actually uh, uh, improve the, uh, that by adding the port to the object directly. So we grab that, uh, uh, that uh, port and add that to the object directly. Port. Perfect. This is especially interesting since it's, it's a high port. So it's maybe something interesting to correlate on as well. Okay, now we have all the data points encoded, but we still don't get a story out of this. It's still just a bunch of different objects floating around in the event, but still much better than it was initially when we just imported the initial text, because now we already see what belongs together. That this URL object belongs together with these data points. This file uh, um, is its own thing that contains additional data points. That's a good point indeed, we forgot. Yep, to we've, we forgot to upload the, the secondary payload, so I will do it right away. So we're already in, in a slightly better shape than we were in the beginning, but we still want to create a graph out of all of this. So let's go over into graph view and start creating our story out of this. Okay, so we have a bunch of unreferenced objects and one unreferenced attribute. So we know that the whole thing started with the initial email. So the email object is our starting point. So let's start with that. That email, first of all, impersonates to be that person John Doe. So let's create a link between those two and we will, we will call the connection as an impersonate uh, reference. Perfect. So now we see that that email impersonates a person. We also see that uh, we can also add that that initial email contained a malicious file. So that was malicious.exe. So we can draw a line and say, okay, this contains that file. We also know that that file connects to uh, 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 or downloads from uh, uh, that secondary place where the secondary payload was hosted, so evilprovider.com. So it connects to evilprovider.com or downloads from evilprovider.com. Uh, this one, right? Yep. Perfect. And we can see that it downloads that this is not malicious.exe file. Mm -hmm. Which then in the end tries to exfiltrate to uh, uh, that secondary uh, URL. Now we missed a few things here that we can still add after the fact. Perfect. 
we, we missed, for example, one of the things that that, e that initial email was sent to us from a given uh, server or a, a mail provider. We can include that uh, too. So we can say send uh, for uh, create a link between the email and that domain IP and say send via, for example, or send. Or, or, uh, we can create a custom one. Or custom one indeed, send via. Perfect. Okay. And finally, we had an attribute that was uh, free floating, which was the CVE. We also know that malicious exa was trying to uh, exploit this. So we can add the relation that says exploits. Now, once we're done with all of this and we look at our graph that we've created out of this, we can see that it's quite easy to read what actually happened. So we see that an email that impersonates a person and was sent via a given server contained a malicious file which then downloads from a given URL, exploiting a vulnerability, downloads a file, which then tries to, uh, when executed, exfiltrate to a URL. So suddenly we've taken our initial data points and we can very easily tell a story uh, out of that based on, on our graph. So we're, we're, at this point, we're quite far ahead in our uh, process. We have now created something that is immediately obvious enough for an analyst most of the time, a lot of the different data points that were included are not that interesting in the long, long run, but you're more interested in the methodology of an attacker. So in those cases, these graphs really tell you the story that you want to see, but we're still missing a few things here. So first of all, we've encoded now all our data points. We have our graph created, but we've still not thought about some of the things that were in the email. For example, one of the things that we were requested to do was to use it only to protect our constituency, this information, and to not do active research on that. So let's encode that information in the event as well. And for this, we will use tags. So first of all, TLP white, we can get rid of that. This is definitely not TLP white. We are meant to, to protect our constituency and not share it further. So let's go with TLP amber in this case, that matches it, uh, that close, uh, closer. Also, we are not supposed to do active research on it. Now there's a really good library for that that we can use called PAP, the Permissible Action Protocol. It works like TLP with the difference that it deals less with who we can share data with, but rather what kind of research we can do on that. So here we see, for example, red is non-detectable actions only. Recipients may not use PAP red information on the network, only passive actions on logs that are not detectable from the outside. This is exactly what we need in this case. So with this, we, we remove any risk of informing the attacker that we know about uh, uh, what they're doing, but we can still do it to, to hunt in our own uh, logs for similar activity, for example. So that's, what, uh, that's one of the good things that we can already encode from here. Now, something else is we, we know that this attack dealt with certain topics that we can encode in more generic terms. And this is where attack becomes really interesting. For example, one of the things that we, we can encode is that this dealt with spear phishing. Uh, or with phishing altogether. So we can either use indeed a taxonomy and use the phishing taxonomy where we can say that it was email spoofing. That's, that's a good one to attach. So let's just submit that. And we can also use attack to, uh, to select the TTP for this in particular. So if we go, if you go over to galaxies. We could also have included spear phishing here. Yeah, sure. Uh, there, there is maybe an additional one to, to add, uh, which is, I think, interesting for, for a lot of, of people dealing with classifying incident and so on. Um, the email that we received say that the spear phishing was uh, failed. So that means uh, it didn't act yeah. into a, to a, to a complete comp compromission. If you go to the uh, incident disposition, um, this one is, is quite interesting because you have uh, uh, not an incident where you can say that this one is failed. So if you go a bit down, you should have it. Yeah, this one. Um, so this one is interesting. Uh, this one is, I think, coming even from, from the US search. Um, because at some point, when you want to uh, search into all your missed events that you collected from your different incident, L desk and so on, you can find out, okay, the one we are not successful, okay, that's great. But the one that was successful is maybe some that we need to work on. Um, so that's Tax is not only for describing the context of the incident, but could describe the result, the workflow, what happens really uh, behind and so on. So it's just a, a, a thing that is contextualizing. So, so don't hesitate to even sometimes ask tags that are more related to the 
complete workflow of the attackers or the result of the course of action for you as a defender or things like that. It's um, an addition to that. What Sam is doing in the meanwhile is he's adding the attack techniques that are related to, the, to this attack. Let, let's just add those few for now. And keep in mind what, what he's doing right now is he's adding this to the event and this entire thing deals with spear phishing and phishing. So that's kind of correct. But if we look down at our attributes, we see that only a small part is actually dealing with the exfiltration aspect. So what we could do is we could go to, uh, to, this, to the second uh, payload. We could select all the attributes in there. And we could label these uh, with the attack technique uh, called exfiltration. Maybe this two are not really yeah. interesting. So attack. Automated exfiltration, perfect. The first one is fine. Okay. Now, one of the other interesting things is we've now added those attack patterns uh, to the event as well. And just as a quick explanation of why this is useful is you can also generate high level overviews over what sort of attacks you're dealing with. So if we go up a bit, we get a heat map out of the event. So if, if someone wants an absolute first look at what we're dealing with here, without reading the graph, without going at the different data points, you already see that we're dealing with something that started as phishing and something that ended in exfiltration. So you already know, get a brief glance of what we're dealing with. The other good thing is this can be aggregated. So it means that, uh, that if you encode this information with every event that you're encoding in MISP, you can start using the API to generate the same attack matrix to basically query uh, questions from your MISP, like what sort of attack patterns were exploited targeting the telco sector, for example. So that's another thing that we, we can encode in this case to make those queries a little bit easier, is we can also encode the target sector uh, on, on the event. So there's sector, and then we can uh, take telco or telecom. Perfect. We can also say that it's, it was targeting Luxembourg. So we can also add it as from the country uh, library. There we go, Luxembourg. So right now, if we were encoding all our events like this, and we were, were querying the API, we could easily uh, get, for example, a comparison heat map of all threats targeting the telcos in Luxembourg of the past three months, and the one from a year ago, for example, in a three month period a year ago. And then if you overlay the two, you see what sort of attack patterns are more used in, for again, certain communities and draw conclusions on what sort of protective measures to invest in, what sort of trainings to send, you, uh, send your uh, staff on and so on. So you get a lot of useful uh, uh, ideas out of that in the first place. So now we're basically done with most of the things in our event. And what we ended up with is really uh, um, uh, an event that, uh, that has enough context for us to make, uh, to turn it into knowledge for uh, in the future together with, all, with our entire other data set as well as being able to quickly understand the flow of the attack that actually happened here or was going to happen if it would have been successful by looking at the event graph. On top of that, obviously, we also have the individual data points. So if you want to create snort rules out of it, we can absolutely do that as well. OK, any questions so far? No? If not, uh, one of the things that we didn't actually do is we didn't actually encode the original email. So uh, one of the, the, the things that you can do in those things, and uh, Sami went extensively over the event report, uh, we can also uh, so encode this as an event report uh, in addition. So it's not only uh, the use case that we've seen before where, we're where, we, where our starting point is an OSINT report and we're encoding that. We can also keep this as an internal reference for us and keep it your organization only and just encode the entire event as it, uh, or email as it was. So that means that if you're an analyst of the organization that received this email, uh, who, who is in the your organization only group in this case, you would also be able to directly view the original email that started this entire event creation. Okay. Now quickly, perhaps uh, uh, just to show uh, the API query with, with attack. Uh, how we would find it that we talked about. Maybe it's a good idea. Oh, yeah, that's that we didn't talk about that indeed. 
So before we move on to that, maybe it's a good moment to mention this. Uh, we didn't really do too many decisions on what should correlate and what we consider as a malicious indicator in here, but you can further make restrictions on them. So for example, in, in, in this specific URL, we see that the port was specified and it was a high port, which might be interesting to include as an indicator. On the other hand, if the, if the other connections were happened through port 80 or port 443, those are not that interesting uh, to, uh, uh, for correlation purposes. So you might still include them in the report or in the event, but it's not something that you would correlate on or that you would uh, uh, create, uh, create IDS rules out of. So just something to keep in mind there. If we further wanted to enrich this event and, and, and to make it more useful, we, we could also rely on external lookup services wherever it is applicable. So for example, we've included the CVE ID in, in the bottom. Now by using one of the enriching modules in MISP, we can do a lookup on that CVE ID itself. So here we see uh, by just uh, running the enriching modules on them, we get a lot of additional information about that particular CV. So we see that this is actually use, uh, compromising uh, uh, the display manager of Windows XP. So it already gives us an idea about what sort of uh, system was being targeted here. Uh, and it also allows us to fetch that information and include it directly in the event. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use CV advanced to go to the CV service and basically retrieve the additional information as an object and include that along with the event. Now, again, keep in mind that we were asked not to do any active research. So while we did uh, this now on, uh, on the CVE, uh, we should not run enrichment services, for example, on IPs, domains, and so on, unless those services are particularly uh, internal and using only offline resources, for example. So passive DNS and so on would be fine. Uh, and the active scanning would not be fine based on the requirements of the uh, original email. And here we see that the CVE now, oops. Ah, perfect. <laughs> so Sammy has recalled the, the layout of the graph that he saved before. So now we can add in addition the information about the vulnerability uh, directly to the malicious file. exploits, yeah. Okay, now don't forget at this stage we still need to publish the event and then we're basically done and it is usable. So let's just do that quickly now and do a, a quick search that allows us to see what, what we've uh, done here. Sorry. Okay. Now if you go to the to the uh, to the uh, uh, API client, so the REST client of, of MISP. Perhaps, uh, yeah, uh, it's okay, just go. Uh, now we can, for example, search uh, what sort of, uh, oh, yeah, you need your API key again. It's, it's, it's all right, it's all right. You saved it, wow. No. <laughs> okay. How would you add a new one? Yeah. There we go. So now what we're going to do is we're, we're going to try to ask one of those questions from this, what sort of attacks uh, or attack patterns were used against Luxembourg in the past year, just to give you an idea of what those queries look like. Oh, what am I doing? <laughs> So for but, inter, uh, turn format, maybe, yeah. Specific. yeah, indeed. That's... Maybe that, that would work better. <laughs> so what I did on the right side, I picked the template so that the 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 tools here, the widget, the, the editor, the text editor uh, knows about all the parameters and options that are available for this specific endpoint. Plus I also have some documentation on the right, uh, which can be used if you don't really know uh, uh, what uh, the what could be the parameters and what they accept. So in this case, uh, it's best to use attack. So we can show that. No? Ah, attack, yeah, sure. So what, what, what was the query you wanted to? The query, uh, let's search for uh, attacks. Mm -hmm. And then uh, country. 
uh, so Miss Galaxy dash. I think it's a it's Galaxy, right? Country, yes. Miss Galaxy country. Yeah, Luxembourg. That's it. So we can, we can look at that and, and maybe at, at a time frame. So publish timestamp of the uh, past three. Uh, I don't know, ninety days. So ninety D. Okay. Yep. So what this will do is it will generate um, uh, the att attack matrix for any uh, type of yep. uh, attacks targeting Luxembourg. So let's have a look. So we so have we the HTML text. Back. We can render that. And then we see in this case, it, it's only this one event that we use, but, but if there were more events, it would generate the heat map out of the combination of all those events and would see the frequency of the different types of attacks and so on. Uh, the idea behind this graph, by the way, is that it, it counts each technique once for any event that has an occurrence of it. So it really shows you the number of different events that uh, contain information about that specific attack. Now, we could basically say that we wanted now to overlay this, uh, or not overlay this, but also get a second uh, heat map uh, out of the exact same data. But instead of uh, from the 90 days uh, ago, we want to see 180 to 90 days ago. So we could create a time range for published timestamp. So we could mm -hmm. convert it to a list. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we set 180 days as the first parameter and 90 days as the second. Or the other way around, it, 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 it won't matter. 80 days. Use it anyway. So this is from 180 days ago to 90 days ago. OK. So in this case, we probably don't have any data for that time. No, we don't. So there is nothing to return. <laughs> There's nothing to show. But this would be the way to, be, to extract that information. Mm -hmm. OK, so that's basically it for this part. Now, uh, perhaps one of the things, Alex, you wanted to show one other event. Perhaps you can do that. And Sami and me, in the meanwhile, we'll look at events that were created. Uh, no? Mm -hmm. yep. Just one last time to advertise uh, the cheat sheet. If you are wondering for some of the specific way to queries, uh, it also provides some example where you could search for the different uh, information contained in the clusters. So for example, if you uh, if you want to search for the the financial all the data that is uh, uh, targeted by uh, uh, as the financial sector, you could do so query search like this. Uh, same for tags. So we've seen that you can ask for a specific tag, but you can also compose your search on tag to have something more complex, like for example, specifying that you want the search to contain well to be to be tagged with TLP green and mal and the malware tag, but do not contain any tag related to the ransomware, where this person character act as a placeholder for uh, any character. Uh, you can also do negation. If you do, uh, put an exclamation mark on front of the tag, you can also negate it. So in that case, you would get all the attributes that uh, are marked or that are tagged with the TLP white but not our uh, tag with the TLP green. So. OK. Yeah. So Alex, uh, are you OK with showing that event that you had in mind? Do you, do you want to do, take presenter or? Perfect. Okay. Are you ordered it, I think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I am relieved. OK, great. OK. Um... So while Andrash and uh, Sami are, are, are digging into the, the exercise and stuff, I wanted to show you uh, an event that has been done for um, a real case. Uh, this one is pretty old, but it's an interesting one because it's, uh, you have a complete uh, full-blown event there. Uh, for the one that are currently on the MISP instance for the training, uh, it's uh, the event ID uh, 2546. Uh, and this one is, is basically a description of the complete uh, activity of the Syrian Electronic Army especially when they uh, uh, compromise a, a registrar um, and uh, basically change the uh, website of New York Times and, and, and some other website for, for a short period of time. Uh, but it's just to show you how you can describe it in, in this and uh, So we have this kind of, of synthetic example uh, that we, we, we use in the exercise. But this one is more like a, a real concrete case. Um, so again, you see that the uh, classification and so on is, is, is quite important. Um, in this one, you have um, some, uh, some some detail there 
about the uh, specific uh, access methods. For example, in this case, it's a very specific case where, where the domain name registrar was compromised. So we have a specific classification for that and so on. Uh, again, we have some, some, some galaxy attached to that, uh, to that one. Um, this one is the um, electronic Iran army, which has different names like the Dead Eye or Jackal. It's, it, it's basically the, the name of the organization. And in this case, the main effect of uh, this attack was a defacement. So it's, it's one of the things. Again, we have a lot of, of column-based information there about, um, it's, it's basically based on all analysis and so on, passive DNS record from the attack and so on. So you see that you have, a, in this case, and for real case, it's very often the case, you have a lot of objects, a lot of attributes and so on. So to dig into that, it's, it might become a bit complex. Nevertheless, uh, you can have a look at the event graph, uh, which is the way to navigate through the uh, specific uh, case here. So if we start to look into it, it makes more sense. Um, so we, we, have, we have in our case here, we have the uh, uh, Syrian Electronic Army, um, which we classify as a person. Um, so <clears throat> it allows us to, uh, uh, to, to make plenty of things like uh, we classify them as suspect, uh, with the full name, the uh, additional information that we have and so on. And then we can start to pivot around that, uh, all the information that we have. Uh, one of the things that is quite interesting there is we, we know that they um, uh, compromised at some point in time uh, a specific reseller of uh, uh, domain names. Uh, this one is Melbourne IT, and at the time it was a pretty well-known uh, registrar um, having data. That, then we can clearly see the relationship there between um, the uh, uh, electronic army, the target, so in this case the victim was the uh, um, uh, Melbourne IT service. But in any case, the direct effect was not the Melbourne IT services. It was just a victim and, and they had a business relationship with, um, with New York Times. Uh, they were basically selling uh, IT services and, and the, the domain and registration. So it's, it's, it's one way to, to, to see the, the different relationship and so on. For, for this case, we did some more additional information collection and so on. And that's, that's one way thing that you can obviously document there. Um, if you looked at the original uh, issue, and so that depending on how you pivot, we started with um, collecting the uh, passive DNS record for the New York Times. And this information is still available. So if you look into those various uh, passive DNS uh, database, you, uh, you are able to extract this data. So that means it's even all data that you can even get out of the systems. Um, and in this case, for, for MISP, we use an object uh, to describe how we did the collection. So in this case, we were using DNSDBQ uh, from Farsight to do the collections. So we have a specific script uh, object where you can detail how you do it. This one is interesting because you can really reproduce. So as an analyst, when you receive such kind of information into MISP, you can reproduce what the other analyst did and validate if the result is correct or, for example, amend it, uh, uh, even to do some uh, additional uh, research and stuff like that. So Adding such kind of information is valuable, and we have plenty of templates in the object. Uh, we didn't dig into the object template that we have, but it's not only cyber security indicators or intelligence at large, it's even script definitions, uh, configuration, things like that, that you can use for, uh, for the uh, collection access. On this one, we, we uh, were able to export uh, all the data sets from, uh, automatically from a tool. So uh, we have seen the expansion through CV, but you have expansion for passive DNS and things like that. So in this case, we were able to extract the information. And the thing that is interesting too, we were able to extract the associated with records that was used uh, for uh, the registration times, uh, allowing us to see the change of the NS record set uh, from one to the other. And we were able to express that the Syrian Electronic Army was basically abusing that abuse uh, with record because it abused with record was the definition of the uh, name uh, services. Um, so you see that in, in this case, we were able to collect a lot of information about the passive DNS and so on. We see that we have a lot of, of additional domain names that were managed by them, like for example, catarleaks.com, uh, things like that. Uh, and again, we were able to extract more information about additional victims. Uh, so you see that at this, this point in time, we were able to extract from that name server. It was not only New York Times, but uh, I think Post was target, uh, Twitter in India, 
uh, sharethis.com, Twitter in UK, um, and so on. So that's the interesting part is when you start to work on a case and you start to pivot by using different tools and so on, you are able to extract such kind of information and you can express it by creating the relationship there. And even if you don't completely know the case, by just looking at the different things, you see the different uh, uh, points. There you, you might ask yourself, okay, but how do you get this attribution there? We have additional indicators, things that are relevant to potential reference to this one. And we even add some specific uh, uh, reference where uh, at some time they were even claiming that it was them. Um, and we, with additional reports. So you can really attach the complete story, the tool that you use for doing the, the, the pivoting and so on from that. And just to maybe uh, conclude on this one, we have an interesting timeline there. Um, so uh, this even timeline is, is constructed from all the data that we have there. So this case was in 2013. Um, so if we zoom in at the exact period of time um, where we had this uh, specific incident, uh, in this case, it will be, uh, yes, it was in August 2013. We see that all the uh, DNS change, for example, and so on, was a specific period of time. And you can even see how long they maintain their infrastructure. And this is basically automatic. So, and that's why I, I think it's important when you create a report, if you have time reference, timestamp, whatever, use it because it's a quick game. You can really use it. For example, in this case, we know that they were operating these domain names for the Syrian Electronic Army, starting from July until January 2014. You have even an interesting uh, case here because we were able to look at the current state of, of registration of domains and so on, and we can see that the domain was basically took over by someone else. Um, for example, for the uh, uh, New York Times changes, you see that this event where they changed uh, a very small uh, um, specific record set was on a very short period of time until that uh, the victim discovered it and uh, changed back the uh, proper record and so on. Uh, but that's quite interesting to have such kind of, of time stamp there. So uh, that's basically it for a kind of even that is interesting. Uh, maybe I can switch over the uh, screen to Sami. Sure, sure. Uh, um... <clears throat> Yep, and I think now we can qu uh, quickly go over some of the events that were created uh, by the participants. Um, so just one moment, here we go. So perhaps um, uh, some, uh, Wiki, some of you can show the events directly, yeah. Let's go to 2554. 2554. Yes, so it's always interesting to see how participants approach creating these events as well. Uh, so we, we, uh, we've done a similar exercise before in the training and it was interesting to see the different approaches and here we see that as well. So in this event, if I'm not mistaken, the free text import was the starting point. Uh, so if we scroll down a bit, we, we, uh, we see that uh, the, besides the, uh, the file objects that are created and that one IP port object, the rest are free flow, uh, floating attributes. And it looks like it's coming from the uh, free text import tool. Uh, so, so that's usually very often how we started as well. It's like, start with just throwing everything that you have in there and do the cleanup afterwards. It's a completely valid way of doing it. Um, uh, so obviously we don't have infinite time during the training so, uh, and, and the workshop, so, uh, so you won't get to everything that we want to have uh, in the event encoded, but this is like a great first way to start and then building from there. So here what we have is all the attributes encoded from, uh, from the free text import. In addition, we have the two uploaded samples encoded as file uh, attachments. So that is all good. Uh, and we have this IP port that is probably not finished yet. It's just the port itself. But what's interesting still in this event is all the additional context that was added. So it was a very uh, so we saw a very good use of the different galaxy clusters and the te uh, taxonomy tags that are chosen. Very uh, comprehensive. We're going into a lot of different alternatives as well from different taxonomies. So it's kind of the same thing. We see the state TLP PAPs. So all the things that we talked about are here. Now, one of the things that, that could be improved on this one is 
some of those things could be moved to the attribute level when you don't really mean the entire event uh, when you're encoding it. But it's really nice to see, for example, things like estimative language also also being used, where you also include like how much trust you have in the uh, in what you're encoding, perhaps also in your sources uh, via, uh, via this, uh, the information credibility that, that is also here that we, for example, trust uh, whatever we get uh, to, from this specific telco at a certain degree, encode that information as well. This is something that comes up very often. We, we, do, we very rarely encode information like sources that we cannot disclose, but our relationship to the source and our trust in the source is something that we can always encode. Because if we don't have trust in, in, in the creator of the, uh, of the initial input that we use for creating the event, then it will be, it should be judged differently when you're building detection rules, blocking rules, and so on out of it in the end. So, so, uh, so this is really nice. And the, uh, the only improvements really that, 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 could, uh, that would have been nice still is, is, is to combine those free floating attributes into objects wherever uh, possible and generating graph out of it. Uh, and to, uh, to move some of the contextualization more to the uh, attribute and object level, especially for things like exfiltration yeah. and so on, where we only know that it's only some parts of it were really tied to that. But it's, it's, it's a very good effort. But that, that is a general remark. I think most of the events uh, yeah. that, that can be applied. Yeah, indeed. indeed. Uh, so, so unless you have something more for this one, or maybe you... Yeah, for, for example, this, this one, uh, we have just a pore, but we don't really know what it means. Uh, neither we don't have the, the ideas flag or the correlate. So this is just a floating attribute that we cannot extract any information out of it, neither automate. Uh, but that, but... This is, uh, like especially in that Cobalus example that we showed, especially the high port was used to scan uh, for, uh, for infected machines. So sometimes the port in itself can be relevant in itself. But if you have the information of, uh, for example, the host that was was used, then that's valuable information yeah. to also include. Okay, so maybe we can go to the next event, which is twenty five fifty two. So in twenty five fifty two, uh, is that one? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Let's go further down. So uh, here, uh, some of the interesting things was that we see a bit more object use. So, so we see the domain IP object and so on that, that are in there that, uh, that show the, uh, the, uh, the composition of this. Uh, but obviously there is, uh, due to limited amount of time, you can't do that for everything in, in this art. And it's, it's good that you do it at least for, for one of them to just play around with and how to combine it to an object and so on. Uh, here, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that the entry came from manual entry. There is one small mistake uh, in the attributes. Uh, the another evil provider.com is picked up as a file name. Um, obviously, if you if an analyst is reading this, you immediately see that that's a uh, that's a mistake. Uh, so that's not that much of an issue, but it will be an issue when generating rules out of this. So it means that. Uh, if I were to use that attribute now in my rules, it would not end up in my network detection rules. It would end up in my host, uh, host intrusion detection uh, set rules. So it's probably not going to be as valuable this way. And there is a question. Uh, remind us again how to add uh, attribute to an existing object. So it's a little plus button in the corner. If you press on that one, it will bring up this dialog that gives you the option of adding any of the attributes that are valid for this specific object template. Now, if this is not working for you on, on your own instance at, at one point, one of the things that can be an issue with that is if you don't have the template for that given object that was used to create that object, then you cannot modify it any, anymore. Uh, that is a good remark. Uh, OK, an existing attribute. OK, indeed. So one of the other, uh, uh, so if, if I were to add it this way to an existing object, then indeed I would end up in a duplicate and I would probably uh, want to manually clean up whatever is left. The other option is if you combine attributes to an object, that's a different story. In that case, you, do, you won't end up with the loose attributes afterwards. So in this case, for example, if you were to pick, um, I don't know, uh, there is no good example here in this, but if you pick a free floating domain, a free floating IP, we could uh, select the two together, so uh, so uh, add the checkboxes in front of two lines. Then we could go on top 
to that little merge button, which is that thing there, group selected attributes. Then we would select a template and it would merge those two attributes in there. You don't do it for now because it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's keep it, yeah, keep it as, uh, as it was created. But, but that would be the uh, tool that would then merge those two attributes into an object. In that, and in that case, the existing attribute is cleaned up automatically. But, but indeed, if, if I see an attribute here that I want to add to an object, I still need to do the cleanup afterwards. Otherwise, MISP will just keep both attributes in there, one in the object itself and one free floating. So that's a good point. We didn't talk about that. Actually, that's a good feature request. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think because it's, it's kind quite easy to do. Yeah. Is, to MISP itself. Add from existing and then also clean up the existing. That's a good point. Yeah, and what Sam is showing now is uh, here, uh, whenever you see something like that, that is annoying, uh, that you would, see, would like to see improved, just create a feature request on GitHub for it. And don't be intimidated by the crazy number of open issues. Um, we're trying to slowly work through the ones that get traction, basically. Also, if you see an issue that also affects you, just let us know about it as well. So for us, if we see that an issue is uh, basically act by several parties, then we probably move it a bit further up in the pile. Uh, so yeah, don't don't be shy on GitHub issues with, with your ideas and uh, comments. Okay. Just do it after. Yeah, that's why. Uh, okay, I, I, thought, I thought you were just copying something. Okay. So that's basically it, I think, for this one. Uh, the, uh, for the contacts, it was a limited set of things that were set on this event, but still the most important things are there. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the one thing that, that could be different is, is be, be careful with overclassifying based on the text of the initial um, uh, mail. Uh, we're, uh, it, it was permitted to share the information with your constituency to, to help protect your constituency. So maybe TLP red is a little bit too strict for, uh, it's more strict than what was required of us. Uh, so, so generally what we try to do is, uh, is we try to share with as many as we can without breaking the requirements and, and needs of those that share data with us. But uh, overclassifying is something that, that can just hurt your, your community in the end. So just be careful with that. That's basically it for this event. We have one more event, um, which is 2547. So remember this event started super early during the training. So it was created in the first few minutes already with, with information that's there. So you're really fast, but then probably tune back into the <laughs> into the actual session rather than continuing with that. But if you if we scroll down, it, it, it's um, a very good start. Uh, the interesting thing with this one is this was the only event that actually contained uh, the event report with the original email. That's really good. Uh, so uh, generally, if you have information like that, encoding that uh, and perhaps sanitizing something out that you don't want included is nice. It was even linked to the uh, attributes in there. So even the parsing was done. So that's super nice uh, to start with that. Uh, on top of that, um, uh, there was some uh, object use for the email. Uh, but here it's again the, the source email, not the actual email that was uh, uh, was uh, part of the attack. But it's still good to encode. So usually either this or the event report is fine. Both together may be a bit overkill for that. But why not? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it won't hurt you. Uh, now, so, uh, some other things that could have been done to improve this is obviously a more contextualization on the data. So galaxies, tags, and so on, as well as converting the attributes to objects. But again, this is something that takes time and is more fiddly. So obviously, uh, there will be less of that during such a short span, uh, time span. Uh, and yeah, I think that was pretty much it. Uh, so I think we're done with the prepared part. So maybe we can open up for some more questions and discussions and then, uh, then we're basically out of time anyway. So if you have any questions, now is a good time or any ideas, okay, remarks. Oh. Or if you, uh, you guys want to add something too. No, that's fine. That's fine for me. I think you cover like the, the most common mistake, it's not really a mistake, but a pitfall, I would say. Uh, 
to always convert attribute into object when possible. Move classification on attributes themselves, if possible, too. Uh, yeah, that's the, the main message. Maybe sometimes things like adding the original source of information, uh, things like that. Um, I'm missing because sometimes if you have a colleague that needs to take over an event, and if you don't have the original source, you have to gather, uh, collect it yeah. again, and so on. So uh, that's one way. I think we have a question there. Yeah, so we have a MIS module for PDF export. Um, so we, there's two things, this uh, MIS module with PDF export. Uh, I don't know if it's enabled on the uh, training one, if we can even try on this one. Um, so it, it's really a very simple module. So it will take all the uh, uh, indicators, uh, objects, uh, attributes, and so on, and do an uh, export. So if you just select uh, an event just to, to have a look. Yeah, um, I want that to use one way. a good one. For example, good okay. one, comprehensive one. Um, download us, is it? Yeah, PDF export is there. So, yep. so this one, if you if you have a MISP install and if you don't see it, it means that you don't have the MISP module uh, uh, installed, uh, but you can just like having a PDF export. The module is quite flexible, so if you want to update it, change it, add additional information there and so on, uh, it, it's straightforward. And, and the PDF output is, I think, quite, quite lightweight. In addition to that, uh, I think uh, Sami showed it through the event report. When you go to a specific event report, you can export in PDF uh, in PDF too. Uh, and this one is through the print functionality of your browser. Um, yeah, and then you can you can uh, basically uh, get the uh, uh, print print export. Maybe in the future we might um, improve that into different uh, way of, of of doing it. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's, that, that works too. Uh, the MISP module one is, is really taking all the uh, attributes and so on, but not the event report currently. But we could extend it to, to add the event report. That, uh, uh, that's one way to do it. So uh, we are eager to get any uh, feedback on that. If you have any idea or things like that, need to improve, just like create an issue like uh, Sammy show, uh, and that's one, uh, one way. Well, I hope it's, this answers your question, Ali. Any other uh, questions? Idea? Think for that? If no, then I think we can conclude the session. Uh, obviously, at any point of time, if you have questions or ideas and so on, just get back to us. Either send us a mail or uh, or tweet at us. So, uh, especially also if you're running a, a miss, for instance, highly recommended to follow our Twitter account anyway. Uh, so whenever there are updates, new things, uh, just hop on over there and, and, and have, have a look. We're, we're tweeting about everything that we do, basically. Also upcoming sessions and so on uh, that we're doing. So hope it was useful for you all. Uh, and don't be shy. <laughs> Reach out anytime you have uh, issues, questions, and so on. And thank you all.